they had not high, high, you know, hiked rates you know, the way they did, that uh, inflation rate would have been higher than what, what it is today. But the point is that given the major drivers of inflation in Nigeria today, as I've said, continuous rate hikes may not really achieve the desired um, uh, result. It requires the government, you know, I keep saying it, to you know, come in and play its rules. The idea of uh, having um, special security forces, for example, to read the forests of bandits, kidnappers, uh, and so on, in, you know, for, uh, to ensure security is, is, is a good one, okay? Because insecurity is partly also causing this inflationary uh, pressure. The idea of cultivating 500,000 hectares of land, um, mechanizing agriculture, is also a good one. So we need to walk the talk in these uh, initiatives to be able to begin to see the impact on inflation. So the government has a lot of role to play to ensure that inflation comes down. There is also the issue of um, refineries. Um, thank God that thank God refinery is coming, coming, up, you know, coming up. But the other refineries too need to work so that we can also see a reduction in the price of petroleum products. Until we see a reduction in price of petroleum products, until we see a reduction and improvement in power supply, we may not really experience reasonable moderation in inflation rate. In the 2024 budget, inflation rate has been projected at 21.4%. But until these things um, happen, you know, we, as I said earlier on, um, uh, the inflationary pressure you know, um, will still remain. So it's not just about the central bank, because saying the central bank should tackle inflation will be like uh, clapping, with, clapping with one hand. You don't clap with one hand. The government and the central bank okay. must uh, you know, work together to okay. uh, tame inflation in Nigeria. Okay. Let's talk about financial recklessness on the, on the part of government. Last administration printed over 20 trillion. This administration has printed about 7 trillion in the space of six months, 7.3 trillion. And they're trying to securitize. What's your take, one, on securitization of ways and means? Two, what would you like to say to the government as regards this so much humongous amount of money they have printed, but we can't see the justifiable spending? All we see is headline news of allegations of corruption. I'm sure you saw the other paper circulating about the chief of staff and three billion from COVID-19, you know, related monies and things like that. Yeah, yeah thank you very much, uh, Rafai. You, you see, um, in this, under the situation uh, in which we find ourselves, we can't overemphasize the importance of fiscal discipline. Um, fiscal discipline um, especially uh, even from the, even from the, uh, the budgeting um, uh, point, point of view. Uh, if you look at the 2024 budget, for example, uh, you could also see one or a few items, uh, you know, that um, ordinarily, you know, sh sh shouldn't be there. Okay, so in terms of ways and means, as I said earlier on, uh, in order to ensure fiscal discipline, the CBN Act was very clear under Section 38 that whatever you're lending, because uh, you can't rule out the fact that um, there may be situations where, you know, in which the government may face um, uh, you know, revenue shortfall. So when you advance uh, credit facilities to the government, it should, it's meant to be short term within the financial year and make sure you repay. Where you don't repay, then you don't uh, advance. These things are very clear. But over, over the years, unfortunately, you know, they were abused. Yes, we had COVID. Yes, we had the economic recession. But all those would have, um, you know, meant going to the National Assembly to obtain um, um, approval, uh, which, of course, is not what um, is not contained in the CBN Act. And that was why it was uh, abused. But if you read the uh, charter of the Bank of Ghana Act and some other uh, um, central banks act, it is very clear that before you exceed, you have to go back to parliament, you know, to get uh, permission. In the CBN Act, it's also very clear that securitization um, uh, you know, it's not permitted. But of course, what we have done is with the, with the approval of um, the uh, National Assembly. They are calling it securitization, actually, but if you look at it in strict terms, it's, it's purely restructuring. What they have done is just to restructure, to move the, um, elongate it for 30 years, and then reduce the rate of interest to, to 9%. Instead of paying interest at NPR plus 3%, uh, you now pay interest at uh, 9%. In other claims, what they do to discourage ways and means is to uh, um, ensure that the, the interest the government pays is at PNR rate, okay, to discourage the government from you know, uh, 
borrowing from the bank. And that's also, that also speaks to the CBN's independence. So on ways and means, I don't think we should um, continue um, you know, ways and means, given what has happened. I think there should be a, a limit on um, ways and means. And remember, too, not too long ago, uh, we had the National Assembly increase the ceiling to 15%. All right? I think that uh, whatever limit that has been set, you know, uh, the central bank governor you know, must stick to that, um, um, that limit. Because ways and means, obviously, help to fuel, um, help to fuel inflation. Um, the evidence is there. If you look at budget performance implementation reports, it tells you most of the time recurrent spending, um, you know, at 100% um, at attainment. But in terms of capital, it's the capital that suffers. So by extension, by implication, ways and means have been used to fuel uh, recurrent. Ways and means have been used to fuel consumption, which is part of why we're having the uh, inflationary uh, you know, uh, pressure. So um, it's not to be advised. I, I want to uh, say that going forward, the um, central bank governor uh, want to go by his word that um, um, he, you know, the central bank will be, will be transparent and the central bank will stick to the order that has been provided in the CBN, in the CBN Act. Well, thank you so much, Professor Waleke. Just before we let you go, I mean, because we're looking at solutions now, we've identified the problems, and I'm glad you've spoken on ways and means and financing, but also we must look at the fact that uh, inflation has an adverse effect on productivity. And it's been, I mean, economists have opined that one of the drivers of inflation, particularly in Nigeria, is lack of productivity in the agricultural sector. I know you've touched on some areas that must be looked into if we're serious about um, stemming um, the rate of inflation. But what are some of those things that we must, because again, it's a multi-pronged approach beyond monetary policy. They may, you also identified fiscal policy and we also looked at productivity in certain sectors especially in agriculture, despite the um, well, good intentions and policies of the last administration, it doesn't seem to have worked quite well. So that the CBN almost became the, the bank of agriculture in itself through its many programs. What would you suggest for this administration in terms of productivity in that sector? Well, the government has announced um, plans to um, cultivate 500,000 hectares of land uh, for maize, rice, wheat, um, ATC. Um, uh, the government um, you know, has also announced, I read the Minister for Agriculture, uh, Abaka Kiari, was talking about uh, rolling out an agri mechanization plan. I think that's, um, that's also um, uh, you know, um, you know, commendable. Um, and the state governments too have to be involved, particularly now that they are sharing um, what they are sharing, you know, appears to be a lot more than what they used to share, uh, partly on account of um, Naira devaluation. So in my view, um, much of what they get now should be ring-fenced for productive, um, you know, activities. Because as Riley mentioned, without production, okay, we'll continue to have this um, inflation challenge uh, because there is always the supply side. But let me also mention that the government appears to be um, uh, concerned, more concerned with the supply side in terms of Forex. That's why we hear they have gotten some $2.25 billion from African Bank. Um, they are also arranging to get some money from a consortium of banks, you know, to deal with the liquidity challenge in the Forex market, the supply side, all right? But until we also address the demand side, I keep saying it, and it bears repeating, the uh, exchange rate issue will still be there. And of course, a higher exchange rate will always feed into higher inflation rates, given the import-dependent nature of the economy. So we are not talking about the demand side, all right? And part of the demand side will require, remember, not too long ago, the central bank opened its doors to uh, 43 items that were previously um, you know, stopped from assessing uh, uh, forex. So all of that has also increased pressure in the uh, official you know, forex market. So how do we deal with the demand side? In my view, part of what we should be doing is to have a law, a buy Nigerian law. Okay, we don't have a buy Nigerian law. In the past, we've tried executive orders, which of course we know um, have not worked. But if you have a law with, with uh, clear penalties, okay, they're stipulating, particularly when the uh, spending involves uh, taxpayers' money, you must not use it for, um, to import 
um, foreign items. And if you look at the 2024 budget, most of those items there, some of the items there, okay, if you have a buy Nigerian law, it will compel their procurement locally, okay? And you can imagine the multiplier effect of that, Absolutely. you know, on the, on the economy. So in a nutshell, we also need to deal with the, uh, the demand side That's while we are looking at the uh, supply side because that's the only thing that can bring down exchange rate um, you know, you on a sustainable basis, on a sustainable backed basis. by production. Thank you for that. Professor Uche Uwaleke, Director, Institute of Capital Market Studies, Nasara State University. Uh, thank you. Now, very quickly, sorry, before we go, uh, I want to go back to autonomy of the central bank. I mean, how realistic is this as a goal? You've already alluded earlier to interference, political interference, but do you think that we will see increased autonomy this time around under this administration? Yes, if the CBN Act is left as it is, you're aware that there are moves to amend the Act to separate the position of the chairman and that of the governor to remove the powers of the central bank to control its um, budget. Um, um, so if the Act is not substantially watered, one of the things I support in the amendment is to clearly stop the central bank governor uh, and the deputy governors from participating in um, you know, um, active politics. That's one I support. But the other um, elements uh, in that uh, amendment uh, to do with the, uh, particularly I call instrument independence of the central bank, operational independence of the central bank, uh, which also operational, part of the operational is financial independence, and even the goal independence. Uh, there are three types of CBN independence. So for me, that should be respected. Recently, the central bank has talked about moving some of the, uh, their offices to, to Lagos, and uh, people, some people are reading political uh, motives into it. I think that shouldn't be the, the case. There is no reason why, for example, banking supervision department of the central bank should be here when the banks, the head office of banks are, are in Lagos. You can't do effective on-site uh, you know, supervision or surveillance when the regulator is um, in far-flung um, um, area you know, from where the entities uh, supervised are. The same argument I make for the Securities and Exchange Commission, where I've always argued that the monitoring department of the SEC should be in Lagos, because that is where the, the, the market um, is. So in a nutshell, I'm saying the independence of the central bank, you know, should be respected. Uh, we have what is called, um, um, you know, legal independence, That's, uh, and then actual independence, all right? Actual independence is, um, the de facto independence, whether it applies in practice, but at least let the laws be there. And uh, uh, if, you, if you have somebody who has, uh, who has committed to um, obeying the laws, um, okay, the laws will help the person to discharge um, you know, um, his mandate. That's talking about this, the central bank governor. So okay. for the central bank to achieve okay. its goal of price stability, independence is very key. So much, uh, Professor Wallach, and thank you for your uh, deep insight as regards, you know, matters of Nigerian economy, and we hope uh, things get a whole lot better. Uh, we go back to Ibado now for more updates on the situation in the state as regards the explosion yesterday. A rise correspondent, Ulutayo Famous Cole, is there. Ulutayo, <clears throat> good morning. Uh, what have you heard? Uh, you've got new pieces of information for us. I'm sure the ordinance team might have come out, and other teams that have come out. I can see an ambulance at your back. Take it away, my friend. Yes. If you look around me, you find family members, relatives, they are all here. Some of their uh, um, family members are still missing, people that reside right behind me here. And I spoke with some uh, uh, victims, the families of the victims, who told me they are making phone calls to their relatives who are still trapped, and they are responding about two minutes ago, a victim was pulled out alive from this rubble. And I also spoke with um, a mother and a baby who was also pulled out, but they are all alive. But rescue efforts are ongoing at, at the moment to ensure that those that are still alive are brought, uh, are brought out and taken straight to the hospital. If you, look, if you look behind me, you find about four or five ambulances parked strategically. They are on ground to take um, the victims to the University College Hospital and indeed any medical facility around. Just in a desperate bid 
to save the lives of those who have been unfortunately trapped in this avoidable accident. This is such good news, and thank you so much for bringing us a spot of light in the midst of, you know, what's a really sad incident in, in Ibadan. I know that a few, you, you, there was a talk of a small baby who was also rescued. Can you t tell us more about that? And also, uh, we hear reports that bed spaces at UCH are quite, um, they, they're all gone. What is the government doing to ensure that you know, well, survivors who are taken from the um, incident space, spot receive adequate treatment when they get into hospital? Are they liaising or working with other private hospitals? And also, is there a need for blood donation? Yes. Um Yesterday, or rather this morning, a 28-year-old mother and a six-month-old baby was pulled out. They were, they, were, they were covered in dust. They were pulled out. Luckily, both mother and child are doing very, very, very well. They were pulled out from this rubble. But the issue now is that they are yet to receive um, medical attention because the, the hospital they went to, according to them, the hospital they went to was asking them for money. But uh, donors here have donated some, some funds for them and they have been taken to uh, a private medical facility because they rejected going to the public medical fa facility. So they have been taken to a private medical facility to receive urgent medical attention. About your question about the, the, the uh, victims that were transferred, to the University College Hospital. Bed spaces there have been exhausted. Bed spaces at the University College Hospital have been exhausted. But the, federal, the state government is making efforts to take victims to nearby hospitals and they've promised to ensure that they foot the bills of these victims. The state government, I also spoke with the Commissioner for Health who told me that People can come forward to the okay. University College Hospital to donate blood Child to victims, but there has been so such a shortage of so much blood and donors at the University That's right. There's a crane, right. there's a crane behind you. Move out of the way. All right, that's all the famous call live from Ibadan. Of course, we will keep bringing you updates as story develops. Uh, good news is that there are more and more survivors. We'll take a short break now, but when we return, we'll be joining our correspondents to bring us updates live from the World Economic Forum. Do stay with us. Guy, with the rising cost of things, we need to plan our next move. Guy, I agree with you. I mean, with the money we make, we should not be struggling with our finances now. Maybe you both need better banking options. What do you know about better banking options? <laughs> I recently moved my salary account to Polaris Bank, and since then, it's been a smooth ride for me. They bought over my existing loan and gave me better interest rates and repayment terms. Are you serious? Yes, as a Polaris salary account holder, I can get personal term loan, auto loan, mortgage, 50% salary advance, credit card, and more without going to the bank. Really? I've got a personal term loan already. See, here's my credit card too. How do I make the move? Simple. Open a Polaris salary account on Vault. Use salary account as your referral code. My guy, I am moving my salary account now, now. Get personal term loan and more with your Polaris salary account. Vault is available on Google Play Store and Apple App Store. Salary and Your flight will be ready shortly now. Thank you. Breakfast in Paris. Hmm, lunch in London. This could be you. And there's more. Hey, Mai, tell them more. Of course. Now this is what I call a win. And this could be you too in the Globe Festival of Joy program. By recharging 50,000 Naira or more within a month, you could be among our 100 winners who will win business class tickets from Lagos to Paris to London. If you recharge 100,000 Naira or more in a month, you could be one of the many winners of a premium bungalow in Nigeria. 
The more you recharge, the more your chances to win. How was your flight? Delicious. Glow Unlimited. Anko HMO is the professional health partner you need to live a healthier and more fulfilling life. Embrace a life of vitality with affordable health plans tailored to meet your health goals. Our network of over 3,000 accredited hospitals ensure you and your loved ones are always in the best of care. Whether it's general health, maternity, pediatric and geriatric care, we have you covered. Call us today on 0800 Anko HMO. Things Anko HMO International. There's a place where we go to when the world gets too loud. <laughs> a happy place of laughter and excitement. Of moments that get your heart racing. Our familiar faces. A place where we all belong. Home is where it happens. Find home on Netflix. Reactivate your first bank account, deposit, and maintain a minimum of 5,000 Naira for just 30 days. And the soft life begins. Transact up to five times on our digital channels. And guess what? You could be a lucky 100,000 Naira winner each month. But wait, there's more. Deposit and maintain 50,000 Naira each month for four months. Or deposit 200,000 Naira for four months. And you could stand a chance to win a whooping 1 million Naira in the grand finale. Don't miss your chance to win big with First Bank. This promo runs till February 23rd, 2024 and is open to new and existing account holders. Terms and conditions apply. Keep transacting. Keep winning. You first. First Bank. If you are truly ready to change the world through sustainable practices, here are 10 epic tips to live with less waste and make a difference. Tip 1. BYOB. Bring your own bottle. Ditch single-use plastic and groove with a reusable water bottle. Tip 2. Skip the straws. Say no to plastic straws and groove with reusable or biodegradable alternatives. Tip 3. Reduce food waste. Tip 4. Repair. Don't replace if it can be avoided. Tip 5. Switch it off. Turning off lights and appliances when not in use can reduce electricity consumption by up to 10% in African households. Tip 6. Water wise. A dripping tap can waste up to 5,000 liters of water. Tip 7. Go paperless. Tip 8. Recycle right. Tip 9. Sustainable transportation. Switching to car pulling for just one day a week can reduce carbon emissions and ease congestion. Tip 10. Conscious consumerism. If every household in Africa replaced one regular light bulb with an energy efficient one, you could save enough energy to power millions of homes for a year. Come join us. Together, we, we can, can make, make a difference. difference. There's a place where we go to when the world gets too loud. <laughs> a happy place of laughter and excitement. Of moments that get your heart racing. Our familiar faces. A 
place where we all belong. Home is where it happens. Find home on Netflix. to the morning show here on Arise News. Now it's the third day of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. And here at Arise News, we've been keeping you abreast with activities at the forum. Well, joining us on the show this morning to update us on what's on the agenda for today is Dr. Ruben Abati, Rolakia Kunkube Filani, and of course, Rotis Odiri. Welcome to the morning show. You look fantastic. Let's get straight into it. Rotis, you look all snuggled up and warm there. China's Premier Li Qiang disclosed 2023 GDP figures yesterday in Davos. Davos, and that was ahead of schedule, and that was confirmed today by the Bureau of Statistics. How do we interpret China's GDP growth, and what are the challenges facing the second largest economy in the world? Good morning, uh, Vimbai. Good morning to the crew and all our viewers out there. I thought that Li Qiang jumped the gun by releasing GDP figures ahead of the schedule before today. But I think what he was trying to do was to instill some type of confidence in China's uh, growth numbers. So it came in at 5.2%, which met expectations. But that was as a result of a low base effect from 2021. So the interpretation here is that China still has a number of economic headwinds. Number one is the property sector which of course has faced a lot of low investment and caused a lot of bearish sentiment towards China. Number two is China's population, which for the second year in a row has fallen. And as a result of a falling population, it has placed questions on whether China should continue to be putting money into infrastructure investment when you have, you know, increasing infrastructure investment when you have a falling population. And that also has ramifications for future economic growth. Number three, is the deflationary um, environment for China. Prices have fallen in December for a third month in a row. So with prices falling, people are not sure if they want to continue spending money because they expect prices to continue to fall. And then, of course, finally, there is the U.S. economy and the U.S. restricting chip exports to China. So those three are the main headwinds facing China. But Li Kang came here to Davos to try to tell people that, listen, China is fine. We're on course with our growth prospects and they expect to keep growing in 2024. All right, thanks, uh, Rotus Rolake. The European Central Bank President, Christine Lagarde, is due to speak at Davos today. What is your read on the EU? Okay, thank you. Good morning, Ayo. Good morning, Vimbai. Good morning, everyone else morning, in the Robert. studio. Good um, really interesting that Kristen Lagarde of the ECB will be speaking because all eyes will be on Eurozone inflation figures. The December reading for Eurozone inflation showed about 2.9% compared to 2.4% in the November reading. So when the EU thought inflation had been slowing down, there seemed to be a small rise in inflation, which sort of threw the market a bit into confusion at the end of last year. And so the question is, what will the ECB do this year? Well, Christine Lagarde coming into Davos, the World Economic Forum, has said there appears to be a consensus amongst ECB officials that there will be a rate cut, an interest rate cut later in the summer. Interestingly, the question is, why does this matter for the rest of the world? Well, rising rates in other parts of the world may mean an outflow of capital from emerging markets to markets like the EU. So it's important for everyone to keep an eye on what's happening with monetary policy in the EU. And speaking of the EU, yesterday we had Ursula von der Leyen, the EU president, talking about the EU with a real focus on Russia and Ukraine. Of course, the big economic story out of that crisis has been global gas supplies and how it's impacting energy demand and energy prices within the EU. Interestingly, uh, Ursula von der Leyen gave a really interesting data point. She said two years ago, one in three units of energy were being imported from Russia into the EU 
but the EU has had to re-strategize around regional energy security. And what that strategy has done is actually improve energy independence within the Eurozone. And as of January this year, only one in 20 units have been imported from Russia. So I think that it really underpins the fact that a geopolitical crisis has helped the EU rethink its own broader energy strategy. And I think potential lessons there for other regions that are heavily energy dependent around the world. So all eyes on the Eurozone. I think Christine Lagarde will be speaking today. The markets will be watching for any signs of where rates might head at the next sitting of the ECB uh, back governor but it's really interesting times to hear from uh, Christine Lagarde and, of course, uh, the EU yesterday with the focus on the Russia-Ukraine crisis and impact on global gas supplies. All right. Dr. Bati, I miss you. I miss you so much. But good to see you out there in Davos. Uh, don't forget your voice here. Uh, 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 Ukraine President Vladimir Zelensky addressed Davos yesterday. And, and, you know, we're two years into the war, over 600 days now of the invasion of Ukraine. What's the sentiment towards the conflict? Well, what is uh, instructive is that for the first time, uh, President Zelensky was addressing the Davos summit in person. Uh, before now, he had done so uh, virtually, but he had the opportunity yesterday to address world leaders and to also meet with uh, investors. Interestingly, uh, Russia was top of his uh, message. They need to continue to put pressure on Russia to ensure that the war uh, between uh, uh, you know, Ukraine and uh, Russia is not frozen. Because, as he said, if it remains frozen, it could be reignited uh, later uh, with even dire uh, consequences. Of course, uh, President Putin has kicked back uh, to say that uh, Russia is winning the war. But what, again, uh, must be noted, of course, is that he's not asking, Zelensky is not asking for weapons. He's asking for sanctions against Russia, uh, particularly with, uh, you know, uh, Russia's uh, access to nuclear power. And also, at the same time, he's saying that, you know, the uh, allies should continue to mount pressure uh, on uh, on Russia uh, for the benefit of the whole of humanity. And secondly, it was also calling for peace, uh, an effort that could even be hosted here in Switzerland involving, you know, world leaders to ensure uh, that that war comes to an end, particularly now that there seems to be a shift to the crisis in the Middle East. What Zelensky's presence here has done is that it has, you know, redirected attention uh, to the conflict uh, between his country and uh, Russia. And he had the opportunity yesterday to also meet on the sidelines with U.S. Secretary of State Antony uh, Blinken, uh, who in fact said, well, despite the uh, uh, hesitation in Congress that the United States is committed to providing support uh, for uh, Ukraine. Uh, Jake Sullivan, the U.S. National Security Advisor, said more or less the same thing, message of hope and optimism and expressing support uh, for Ukraine. And you see the same line about collaboration, about cooperation uh, in resolving global conflicts uh, to have positive impact was also reflected in the statement by Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, the uh, European Commission president, who was saying that, yes, 2024 may be the big election year, but at the same time, peace is important, security is critical, and he pledged the commitment of the European Commission uh, in this regard. Um, well, the other thing, again, was that when uh, the uh, prime minister and foreign minister of uh, Qatar spoke, uh, he drew attention to the need uh, to also ensure peace in the Middle East. So yesterday, there was a lot of talk about peace, security, and collaboration and cooperation, a message of hope. And that line is likely to continue today when we have the address by uh, the UN Secretary General, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, uh, will be speaking today. And there's also a conversation uh, later today, uh, or this morning at 10 a.m., uh, with uh, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who will be uh, addressing the theme, speaking truth to power. And then, of course, the foreign minister of Iran uh, will also be speaking today. And a lot of people will be interested in what the Iranian foreign minister would, would say, uh, given the uh, crisis uh, in the uh, 
uh, Red Sea, uh, the Suez Canal, uh, with the Houthi rebels uh, based in, uh, in Yemen. And then for the economies, of course, uh, there will be a lot of interest generated by Javier Millet, uh, the president of Argentina, who will also uh, have uh, a special address today, uh, you know, developing on the issue about economic growth and, uh, uh, you know, equality and also, you know, uh, debt, inflation, uh, the global uncertainty that have been indicated in the global economic report that has been launched at this conference. Fantastic. Dr. Abati, I hope you're able to find some pepper soup over there because I think that's <laughs> what do what that weather calls for. <laughs> Rota Sudiri, Rolakia Kinkube Felani, and of course Dr. Ruben Abati, thank you so much for your updates. And of course, we look forward to hearing more from Davos. We'll take a short break now, and when we return, we we'll, shall be speaking to Israel Ayer, that's partner at commercial and energy law practice. Candelt, do stay with us. Hello, my name is Odumba Taiwo. I was once a stylist, but I wasn't having much passion in it because I was forced to do that. And the only person I understand my feeling was my church pastor who introduced me into this training that's um, half of fidelity and helped me to apply for it. And it was just like a dream come true for me. My name is Engineer Joy B, popularly known as Lady Benz Auto Mechanic, Nigeria first female Mercedes Benz specialist. I met fidelity a year ago to partner with me and partnering with Fidelity has been a very huge relief for me. There's a lot of people out there who actually want to acquire these skills but they don't have the opportunity. Platforms such as this provide the opportunity to drive the necessary conversations around promoting a world free of gender bias. We are Fidelity. We keep our My kids are more than precious to me. Seeing them doing well, healthy and happy brings me so much joy. I know it's my responsibility to ensure they are well nourished. So I use Dangote salt in my cooking. It is high quality salt that's refined and iodized to give great taste to my meals and also support my family's health and well-being. And it's got a name that I trust. Dangote salt is refined and iodized to help prevent iodine deficiency disorders. So give your family meals that taste delicious and support their well-being with Dangote salt. It's time to care about your salt. Choose quality, choose Dangote salt. So, there is a small problem. Despite all the entertaining ads we've created for you, some of you still haven't tried our services. Come on. First of all, we are a licensed microfinance bank. Sorry about that. For instance, you can open a business account with us and get our POS with it. It's good for your business. 99.99% reliable. I love it. <laughs> our card is the one. My money no the hang. You can open a business or personal account with us in a minute. I'm the body now. The go one and Our customer care is available. Abby? So, when it comes to reliability, security, convenience, and speed, you only need one bank. Join millions of happy customers. Download the Money Point app or find an agent near you to get started. This ad is a Money Point ad. Don't forget that. Money Point! Hi, I'm Pat Rankin, and they don't call me what best for no reason. I only deal with the best. Be it auto or business, a 100% claim is always guaranteed. Welcome to World Class Insurance Services. We are Anchor Insurance. We are insurance truly for us.
Thinking of banking in Africa. Think Zenith. In today's fast-moving, fast-changing world, you need a financial partner that understands your unique expectations. A bank with presence in major financial centers across the world, with the enabling platform to facilitate seamlessly, whenever, wherever, however. A bank with best-in-class financial solutions from a superb combination of technology and human touch for easy, fast, and secure banking that creates real value. Turning dreams into reality is now in your hands. People, technology, service. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. The Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, NNPCL, has called for expression of interest forms uh, from qualified oil and gas firms for the operation and maintenance of the newly refurbished Port Harcourt refinery. In a notice to its would-be clients, the National Oil Company stated that when the process is completed, the outcome would help improve dependability and sustainability to meet the country's fuel supply and energy security requirements. In 2021, Group Chief Executive Officer of NNPC, Mele Kiari, stated that the federal government was considering a plan to become a minority shareholder in the beleaguered oil refineries. That was after the Federal Executive Council, FEC, signed off on a $1.5 billion rehabilitation plan funded largely by Afriksim Bank, as well as from internally generated revenue by NNPC for the Port Harcourt Refinery, Refining Complex, which has a capacity of 210,000 barrels per day. In a separate statement, NNPC said the operate and maintain model was one of the key requirements by the lender for the Port Harcourt project. In the public notice, among others, NNPC stated that any company applying to operate and maintain the plant must present its audited accounts between 2019 and 2022, as well as demonstrate a minimum average annual turnover of $2 billion between 2019 and 2022. However, former Vice President of Nigeria, Atiku Abubakar, has faulted the plan by the NNPCL for a third party to manage the Port Harcourt refinery after its rehabilitation. Atiku argued that the federal government ought to have privatized the refinery instead of commencing rehabilitation. Joining us on the show this morning to discuss this latest NNPCL initiative for the running of the Port Harcourt refinery is Israel, i.e., partner at commercial and energy law practice, Cadelp. Good morning, uh, Ms. Aya, and thank you for joining us on The Morning Show. All right. I'll start... Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. I'll start off with um, former Vice President Atiku Abubakar's position. Let's even have that conversation. The NNPC is opening up to invite an expression of interest form from private organizations to um, manage the Port Harcourt refinery on completion. However, the vice, former vice president is of the opinion that they shouldn't even be asking for, you know, other, you know, for partners to come and manage. They should instead sell the refinery outright to avoid the debts that will accrue from holding on to the refinery. What's your take on his position? Thank you very much. Um, so several years ago, um, I remember that was probably uh, the onset of the Obasanjo regime. Uh, then I used to be employed uh, with one of the international oil companies. And I remember that uh, the government of the day made very desperate efforts to offload the refineries then uh, to a number of potential uh, investors or entities that have the capacity to be able to run this. And they, 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 uh, there wasn't that much appetite for it. Of course, at the, uh, in the twilight years of that particular regime, uh, the then 
uh, sold to a consortium that comprised uh, of uh, Dangote, I think Cotelola, and a few others, uh, which sale was rescinded uh, during the Aradua regime and all that. But the whole point of this history lesson is to say that the subject of uh, divesting, privatizing, or selling off uh, these uh, uh, entities or these uh, refineries is not as simple and straightforward as people think. There's probably not a lot of appetite for it. What some of the experts have said and have heard is that it's probably easier to build a brand new refinery <coughs> than to, excuse me, <coughs> uh, than to, to take over these refineries and refurbish them. As a matter of fact, if you, if you have heard some of the commentators, I think uh, Engineer Ogedegbe, who used to be managing director of the Portacot refinery as well as the Kaduna refinery at some point, indeed expressed the view and opinion that what was going on was in fact a, a replacement of the equipment. They're literally stripping off the old, uh, and, and as a 60,000 uh, barrels a day uh, capacity uh, component of that refinery, and they're replacing them. So, indeed, if you said sell, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 our experience show that there's probably not a lot of people who have the appetite to buy or for, for, for good value. So, that's probably the way to look at it. Um, indeed, if you had a car, and a fairly used car, and you wanted to sell it, it's unlikely that you would, if you put it out in its state, then it probably would go uh, as crap. But if you refurbished it a bit and then you sell it, then you probably can get better value for it. Uh, just without, I'm not necessarily part of this, I'm not holding brief for the authorities, but this particular approach, if executed very well, is probably a, a, a good installmental approach to offloading or moving these refineries to people who can better manage them. Right. No, I'm, I'm glad that you gave us some of that historical insight because in that quest to try and offload these assets, one of the reasons uh, some of the majors would give for being unwilling to engage was that uh, refinery business is about scale and that uh, these refineries, specifically Port Harcourt Refinery as well, simply doesn't have the economies of scale for it to be a feasible business model. Now, with $1.5 billion in debt... What is the likelihood that we're ever going to be able to get out of this debt when we're now calling in for operational and management partners who are going to be taking a good chunk of the proceeds of the refinery business? Well, that's a good question. And indeed, uh, implicit or yeah, kind of implicit within that particular approach is uh, or the implicit acknowledgement of that approach is that uh, government or the entities that are currently running it are probably putting up their hands and saying, well, look, we're probably uh, not able to run it uh, and to run it sustainably. You know, and, and so that's what uh, effectively uh, I, I think it implies. Now, of course, uh, I would take what has happened more as a courtship. So for any entity that has that sort of capacity, by the way, $2 billion turnover, uh, is not a, a small amount of money, but assuming you can find that sort of entity either here or abroad, uh, they're more likely to be international entities. Uh, what is done is that it's provided, an, like I said, an instrumental approach. So without putting out the capital outlay to acquire the entire entity, you can come in on terms. Of course, the devil is in the details, as we say in my profession. You know, so you can come in on terms, uh, which will be as to the returns, the fees payable, the, ter the term, the tenure, you will definitely have to cover. It will have to cover your your overheads and return a reasonable margin for a guaranteed minimum period. Yeah, and if you come in and you then can see the facility from that sort of inside position, you can then take a long term position. You can decide that okay, I can make this profitable. Then perhaps uh, uh, take out uh, the existing uh, facility acquire the, 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 the refinery maybe as base load to, to an expansion program. Uh, and then uh, from a transactions point of view, that is uh, a potential approach to it. But I have to add that in addition to scale, one of the things that was a disincentive to investing in local refining was uh, basically the, uh, the regulation of the downstream. Now, thankfully, the Petroleum Industry Act has 
provided a platform and a basis for that to stop. And so the downstream, uh, in effect, now can be deregulated and persons can hopefully sell at cost-reflective prices, return their cost and be able to make a margin. You know? And so, indeed, wherever you start, and, the, and I said that to say this, that uh, in terms of the economies of scale, uh, what it really means is that it does not matter where you start, as long as you can make a return, a fair return for your investment, then wherever you start is, a, is your base load, is your start point. And you can scale, as it were, uh, to supply in the local market and export uh, uh, regionally. Okay, so I'd like to ask, with this uh, call for partners, as well, or people that run the refineries, uh, are we set to go? Is there still another investment <clears throat> these people will have to make, you know? And how realistic is it to get people that have, or companies that have that might, you know, with over two billion in annual turnover and all of that? Then what will also be the process of accountability? Is it going to be just be given to cronies and friends that can just, you know, justify and they can do some quick books, cookbooks for them? Uh, is that going to be the case? And uh, what's going to be sort of like the long-term environmental impact assessment? Because this area, this refinery is working, and when it was revamped in the 70s, or when it was built by Shell Daisy in 65, 70, thereabout, you don't have this level of development around that area. So what is the impact assessment now like? These are multiple questions I want to ask. Yes, uh, multiple. Uh, I was going to say double barrel, but this is, uh, this is almost like machine gun fire. Uh, but great questions, all of them. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, you know, the questions that honestly are begging for answers. Um, and, and, and I'll respond to as many as I, as I can remember. Um, indeed, uh, finding, and, and I alluded to that earlier on, finding an entity that has a turnover about $2 billion you know, the question to ask is, would it be profitable to take over uh, an aged uh, facility and see how you can run it? Or would you just invest the $500 million, build a small thing, test your metal and all of that? I think the, the value proposition here is that um, you basically will observe, uh, I mean, the federal government is observing uh, all the capital outlay associated with refurbishing or sort of effectively reinstalling this particular facility. And so the O&M uh, provider would uh, simply just need to mobilize uh, personnel um, and um, equipment is in, 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 in place, uh, mobilize personnel into place and uh, the overheads are associated with that. Like I said, what we have is a request for, uh, it's an RO, what's it called? I'm not sure it's even a request for proposal. It's a, I think it's an EOI in, in, um, expression of interest. It's an EOI. So it's very early in the day and early in the process. Now, to one of the questions you've asked, and it's an excellent question, by the way, uh, to say, look, what would be the accountability for this? And it really is up to you and me. And by that, I mean the media, the press, that is the fourth realm of the estate, and the citizens, is that the natural resource economy cannot be, and cannot be shrouded in, in secrecies. You know, and that is what the, uh, uh, what's it called now, the um, transparency, the ex extraction industry, transparency international. And you might argue that, okay, refining is not necessarily a, a, a extraction industry, but it's associated with tra a, a tra extraction industry. And I would make the argument that you know, those principles should apply, the principles of full disclosure. I mean, as you're aware, the principles of the EITI have in fact been embedded within uh, the Petroleum Industry Act to the, to the extent that you can no longer hide, particularly when it involves uh, public uh, companies, when it involves governments. You, you should no longer be able to conceal the details of a transaction on the basis of confidentiality. Even if confidentiality provisions exist, you know, the provisions of the EITI protocol, which is one, domesticated within Nigeria, and two, incorporated by reference, uh, not by reference, honestly, by direct mention in the Petroleum Industry Act, 
you know, the citizen and the press should be able to, uh, to, 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 to insist and to call for the disclosure of at least key points of any uh, transaction. So the key really is, is this spotlight going to end with a few sound bites when the matter is hot? Or are we going to be able to set up a process of keeping up with this? So it's, like I said, it's just the EOI. Now, beyond the EOI, who are, I mean, is there a way of tracking the people that are, uh, that, are uh, that have expressed interest uh, right through the RFP phase, right through the selection phase, right through the negotiation phase, right through the highlights of the agreement? That is how we can avoid even the PNID. Because, again, I mean, I, I'm one of those persons who feel that even though Nigeria dodged the bullet there, that it is really, it will be a tragedy if we repeat those, those same errors. And the way to not, have, to, not, to not repeat those same errors is to do a proper post-mortem and ask ourselves what went wrong. And one of the things that went wrong with PNID, in my opinion, is that that particular transaction was uh, shrouded in the typical commercial secrecy, which shouldn't be the case. The thinking essentially is that whoever negotiates this thing on behalf of the people, you know, uh, is in, a tr in the position of a trustee and is accountable to the people. You know, and so that's where your, uh, your point comes to. Um, again, whether this is sustainable, quite frankly, I was having a conversation with a, a friend of mine yesterday, and I said, look, I, uh, firstly, I, I, I think that the, the financiers uh, took a leap of faith to release funds before this particular process was in place. Because indeed, if this was a purely commercial uh, transaction, my, my sense of it is that uh, the O&M should have been in place as a condition precedent to disbursement of the funds. But where we, here we are. Thank God NMPCL uh, has some conscience, and they are keeping faith with that particular financing requirement, and uh, they're going to put it in place. So, again, we'd like to see what the terms are, what the returns are, what the tenure is, you know, and hopefully that will be like a courtship to eventually divesting out of that and reaching that old objective of NMPC becoming a minority shareholder, or as the case may be, a non-shareholder at all. All right. From a business perspective, Mr. Aye, I'd like you to share with us. What do you mean? Because, I mean, we've, I, I outlined the requirements um, by NNPCL for whoever would become their partner, $2 billion and from 2019 to 2022 balance sheet. From a business perspective, do you think that the potential or the prospect of coming on board to manage um, the refinery in Port Harcourt makes business sense? Would it be attractive for a number of these organizations to want to um, partner with NNPCL? I mean, you've talked about a number of things around governance, um, transparency, and the likes. As it currently stands, do you think that um, you know, organizations will be knocking down the door of NNPCL to submit their bid? Is it commercially viable? Mm. OK, um, so it's difficult, um, and let me explain. <laughs> it's difficult to say, because you see the parameters or the investment criteria for organizations differ. You remember uh, part of the history lesson we began with was that all the IOCs did not have the appetite uh, to, to take over any refinery or indeed build a new one. And some of the things we heard or were told at the time was that, oh, well, as long as the downstream stayed regu I mean, regulated, and as uh, then there was no uh, case uh, to invest in, in, a refine in, in a refinery, in a private refinery in Nigeria, and as long as you, know, you regulated uh, the price at the pump. But then along uh, came uh, Dan Gote uh, then, and, you know, and then they came up with the concept of the export uh, processing zone. And so he's uh, producing essentially outside of Nigeria, notionally, and then selling at a cost-reflective price. And then you can decide to, uh, to, to, to subsidize it at some point. And then the point is this, is, is then the model, is the business model of the entities that are concerned. Yeah, and, uh, but just off the top of my head, based on everything I know uh, around the industry, I'm wondering, uh, to your question, will there be people beating down the doors? How many people can beat down the doors? That have, you have to understand first that the appetite for investing in Nigeria is a bit low, unfortunately. We need to do more to be able to increase the appetite 
uh, to, to attract investment in, in, in this place. And one of those things will be a sanctity of contracts, those kinds of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of uh, assurances that people would need to receive. And you're probably just going to have a handful of persons with capacity, serious contenders from around the world. And um, I think the deal they're going to be asking for would be a steal effectively. Uh, uh, in other words, they're going to be asking for margins that are above the average because of the issues around country risk. So look at the dispute resolution areas as well. You have to ensure that it is a mechanism that is accessible to them and they can uh, easily. I mean, for example, how did we unlock, how did Dubai unlock investment? It was by creating a Dubai arbitration center, which essentially allowed persons who invested within the Dubai, uh, in Dubai to go to that arbitration center rather than the Sharia law. So those are some of the things that I, I imagine uh, the decision makers are looking at and putting in place to ensure that, um, and that they get serious contenders for this. But directionally, the approach is not a bad one. Um, it's going to be tough to get people to, take, to, to even come and buy the scraps. Uh, anybody who has that money would rather build a new one. But if you have something you want to offload, I think that uh, refurbishing it putting it out on, on these terms, and uh, seeing how it goes from there is probably not a bad approach. All right, uh, Israel, I a partner at Commercial and Energy Law Practice, Candel. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, absolutely informative. Right, we'll take a short break now, and when we return, we shall be speaking to Professor Miles Davis, that's the Vice Chancellor of Wigwe University. Do stay with us. There's a place where we go to when the world gets too loud. <laughs> a happy place of laughter and excitement. <laughs> of moments that get your heart racing. Our familiar faces. A place where we all belong. Home is where it happens. Find home on Netflix. Thinking of banking in Africa, think Zenith. In today's fast-moving, fast-changing world, you need a financial partner that understands your unique expectations. A bank with presence in major financial centers across the world, with the enabling platform to facilitate seamlessly, whenever, wherever, however. A bank with best-in-class financial solutions from a superb combination of technology and human touch for easy, fast, and secure banking that creates real value. Turning dreams into reality is now in your hands. People, technology, service. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. Excellence doesn't happen overnight. At 21st century innovation, and now, there is no limit. At the United Bank for Africa, we are committed to delivering the best for you. We have deep roots in Africa. Across our continent, we drive financial inclusion, trade and entrepreneurship. We operate in the United Kingdom and in France, 
We are the only African bank with a national banking license in the USA. We understand the importance of the Gulf as a hub for global trade. Hey Leo, split the bill into four please. UBA is built on our cutting edge technological infrastructure that guarantees not just to take Africa's talent and perspective to the world, but to bring the entire world back home. Because the one thing you can trust is we will always be there for you. UBA, Africa's global bank. Your flight will be ready shortly now. Thank you. Breakfast in Paris. Hmm, lunch in London. This could be you. And there's more. Hey, Mai, tell them more. Of course. Now this is what I call a win. And this could be you too in the Globe Festival of Joy promo. By recharging 50,000 Naira or more within a month, you could be among our 100 winners who will win business class tickets from Lagos to Paris to London. If you recharge 100,000 Naira or more in a month, you could be one of the many winners of a premium bungalow in Nigeria. The more you recharge, the more your chances to win. How was your flight? Delicious. Glow Unlimited. So, there is a small problem. Despite all the entertaining ads we've created for you, some of you still haven't tried our services. Come on. First of all, we are a licensed microfinance bank. Sorry about that. For instance, you can open a business account with us and get our POS with it. It's good for your business. 99.99% reliable. I love it. <laughs> our card is the war. My money no the hang. You can open a business or personal account with us in minutes. I know body na the go one and kujira. Our customer care is available. Abi? So when it comes to reliability, security, convenience, and speed, you only need one bank. Join millions of happy customers. Download the MoneyPoint app or find an agent near you to get started. This ad is a MoneyPoint ad. Don't forget that. Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. Education plays a vital role to the evolution of any nation. That's why investment in the sector is very important. What is education without having well-equipped schools that possess all the qualities needed for the growth of students? That's where universities such as Wigwe University comes to the fore. Wigwe University is unwavering in its commitment to excellence in education and the shaping of future African leaders. The school's purpose is to build and nurture truly responsible, fearless leaders that will drive transformative change in Nigeria and Africa. Wigwe University stands apart as an educational institution with its unique mission to go beyond providing a world-class education. Joining us on the show this morning to discuss what the university is about and what their fearless legacy stands for is <laughs> Professor Miles Davis, the Vice Chancellor of Wigwe University. Good morning, Professor Good Davis. Good morning. And to thank, the show. thank you for having me here today. Uh, I'm very excited to be joining uh, the three of you for this most important conversation. If I may, if I can just put in a promo, uh, I was watching your show earlier and I was listening to the conversation that the professor was talking about economic development. And unfortunately, uh, Africa in general, uh, and Nigeria uh, in particular, these are seen as places where we give foreign aid. This is not the approach to build an economy. Mm -hmm. The approach to build an economy is to build an infrastructure where people who are from that country are able to develop and engage in leadership that they can hire people within the country and not depend upon foreign aid. 
this is how Nigeria economy is going to grow. This is what Wigway University is doing. It is committed to developing those future entrepreneurs and those future leaders to help grow our economy and not be dependent upon someone else's aid to do it. Very well said, and that's a great way to open up because you've talked about Twigwe University. Before we started, mm. before we came on air, I talked about the fact that I've heard about it everywhere. <laughs> it seems like everyone is talking about Wigwe University. So tell us, what's so special about Wigwe University? Well, first of all, you cannot talk about building a world-class anything, particularly a world-class institution, unless what you do to the lead-up of that institution is world-class. And so we have made sure that the message is out and, and people have the information to do that. What makes Wigway University unique? What makes Wigway University different is the fact that from the ground up, we are building an institution that is committed to developing future leaders, committed to developing future entrepreneurs, committed to promoting prosperity in this country. And I, I just want to pause for a second because there are a couple of people that I have to acknowledge, because we could not do this without their support. Uh, one is the Howe Foundation, under the leadership of Miss Yvonne, uh, who has done a tremendous job, uh, who actually is here uh, with us today in the studio. She's just not in this room. As well as uh, Herbert Wigway, who had the vision to think about what it is that we're doing here. Great. Now, of course, one of the things we have heard uh, in the lead up, well, what first grabbed my attention, I saw a campaign, Fearless Legacy, yes, Fearless Legacy. Yes, what yes. is this all about? <laughs> can, you, can you unpack this? You've already alluded to it a little bit, but yeah. can you unpack it further? So, so I'm going to pick up on a conversation that we were having a little earlier about my venture to Nigeria. I was a little afraid to come to Nigeria. I was a little afraid because... Yeah, I had never been in the country before. I had not spent time here. Yes, I've, I've traveled a lot and I've lived in different places. But quite frankly, uh, most of the news, not only about Nigeria, but most of the news about the African continent tends to be very negative. And so I asked myself in my mind, why are you doing this crazy thing? And so there was a bit of fear. There was a bit of hesitation because any time that you leave your comfort zone, you're going to experience fear. And so what I've come to realize that more dangerous than fear is complacency, where you're comfortable doing something because you're not going beyond. Being fearless means that I recognize that there is something that is challenging me. There is something that is causing me to pause and step back, and I have to assess the risk involved in that. So thereby, being fearless means I understand this risk, I know what the challenges are, but I'm going to continue to move forward as opposed to just being captured by the fear that often paralyzes people who will not move forward on things because they're so afraid of trying something new. We stay stuck in all kinds of bad relationships, bad enterprises, bad everything because we're afraid to try something new. Okay, so at first, yes, I want to check on the timer. <laughs> How many days? Oh, we man. Pop quizzes. I, I Pop hate quizzes. Even the faculty. Pop can, can quizzes. We, oh yeah, can, we, can you go on the website so uh, we can know the exact day, website. the exact time, the exact hour? 249 days uh. and maybe 249 days and... 12 hours. Okay, I am. Check How it out. How close I am. I'm about the to countdown. verify the countdown. Verify. <laughs> verify. It's wegwayuniversity.edu.ng, by the way, so yeah, in case yeah. people wanted to check as yes, well. So, yes, yes. Give me a second. Okay, okay. I, so, so, I love coming. journalists that fact check me in real time. Yeah. That's okay. So, so, yeah. so, so what, 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 what would you say, you know, would be the focus here in terms of what you intend to achieve as you know, the VC of this university. And, and congratulations to you. you. I wish you Thank the very you. best. I, and Nigeria is a good country. It, it Everybody, is, every is. country's got its challenges, but we are right. unequivocally, unequivocally passionate yes. about the potential we have in this country. So that's why we have a love affair and we're stuck on it. Yes. And trust me, when you start to have your jollof rice and your local food <laughs> and your amala and your eba and your tuo shinkava and your pomo and everything, yeah. 
The, the love affair just Stop, grows. you're making me hungry. So I mean, you, you, we, you we, should, we you, have to go eat something after the show or you, whatever. You should, I right. need to take you out there. We should get hungry. Okay. Okay. So what's going to be your focus as you, okay. you, know, you go through your early days? Are you still trying okay. to educate well, on these numbers? It looks like maybe you've sent a signal to the website just so that we're having none days, none. So they're recalibrating the okay. number of days. <laughs> well, it's down to days, hours, minutes, and seconds if you'd like to follow. Once okay. it's you know, recalibrated. Right. So, so our vision is lofty but attainable uh, we don't want people to just go get jobs we want people so you said what would I like to accomplish I'd like to see people leave Wigway University and launch enterprises and quite frankly that is not just a wish we've built that into the structure of the university we are going to support them through entrepreneurial ventures uh, we're going to support them with venture capital. We're going to support them with mentorship that will allow them to accomplish their dreams. The other thing is this. We want to create leaders that can not just lead the business, but that can help lead the country. You are absolutely right. Nigeria is a fantastic place. It is a fantastic place. My experience in the time in which I've been here has been amazing. The people I've met are so full of life and so resilient despite all the challenges. They have a high degree of grit and ability to persevere, and they should have more. And what I mean by that is this. I see people on the streets engaging in commercial enterprises of all sorts. And in my mind is, what stops that from moving to a higher level? What stops them from having an operational shop? When I look at some of the challenges that you were discussing on your show earlier today about economic growth and development, what stops that from happening? Leadership matters. And so uh, let me be clear. I, I am not uh, in getting into politics. I'm not discussing the present leadership. Please do not take that this way. What I'm saying is that we can always do better. Yeah. And so you have to do that with intentionality. You have to tell people that have more of a love for the country than they have for themselves in their own particular pockets. Yeah. This is how you develop an economy and turn it around. If you want an example of what I'm talking about, because people say, well, this is just a pipe dream. One of the things that I have in the back of my mind as I watch this is what has happened in Singapore in 25 short years. 25 years. A country without half the resources that Nigeria has. We can do better. Yeah. We can do better. Very well said. Now, talk about leadership. A quick look at your website to yes. we'll talk about the distinguished leadership of the university, right from the visionaire to you, the vice chancellor, yes. and of course, the board of trustees, yes. carefully selected leaders yes. to govern the university. That has to be said. You know, from the chair, Dr. Deria Woshika, of the yes. board of trustees, phenomenal lineup of um, or, or setup yes. of leaders. But let me ask you very quickly we go yes. University is supposed to be an academic hub for students you know, in Nigeria, in Africa, and indeed the world. Yes. For Nigeria, the NUC's requirement yes. for going into university is a UTME. What would be the requirement for international students? So at this particular point, because we're underneath an NUC uh, probationary license period, we are not presently taking in international students because we have to meet the requirements of existing structure. The NUC has been very clear about this. We are going to stay in the center of this. And then as we move forward, we will explore the best options to attract the best and brightest. Because remember, we are setting up primarily underneath the NUC license to serve Nigeria. And so we have to be in compliance with all applicable Nigerian uh, laws and regulations. And so as you know, there's a probationary period. And until we graduate our first class, it becomes hard to maneuver outside of any of these things. But even in that conversation, will still be in compliance, and we will look for the same qualifications that we have that any of the other institutions in Nigeria do in admitting international students. I also want to put in, point in something. Nigeria, at one time, was a great hub for international students. Yes. And you have to ask yourself, what happened to that? Why did that change? And so there is a, a blueprint. There is a, uh, a way in which this can be done that we will look to see how that works within the context of Wigway University. 
Uh, I love that you say that. And, and you know, when I think about this, I, I, I recall my own experience going into university, and yes. I was very intentional about wanting to pursue my degree from an Afrocentric perspective. Yes. So yes. having said that, how different is Wigwe yes. University? Oh oh Am I God. speaking your love language? Oh, yeah. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Tell me about we the curriculum. About this all day long. <laughs> okay. So, so first of all, I want to pick up on your last uh, comment, uh, which is about an Afrocentric perspective. Uh, we are doing amazing things. And we talk about uh, being a premier institution and the model of some of the great premier institutions in the world. But the US institutions were set up to serve people in the US. British institutions were set up to serve people in the US. We're set up to serve people within an African and the African diaspora. And so what that means is that our students who are coming in will take courses in African history. It is amazing how many people uh, here in abroad don't understand the history of Africa. When I mention about having international students in the drawer and what other universities have done historically in Nigeria or on the continent, people don't know about this. All they ever see about us, particularly outside the country, is a flies around eyes and swollen bellies. I'm not saying that that doesn't exist uh, at times and parts, but there is so much more. So that's number one. Number two. We're doing things that are relevant to the continent. A lot of people uh, outside of Nigeria don't recognize that Nigeria has the largest film industry on the continent. And so we have uh, a filmmaking uh, production. Our partnerships are going to be transformative about who we're bringing in to help uh, assist with that. Number two. We are also doing something that, again, it, it's amazing. I guess and maybe I'm, I'm just speaking from my own experience. I had no idea how vibrant the art scene was here. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's amazing, amazing artists. So we're doing art, and we're doing art, entrepreneurship. There's also a vibrant banking section here. So we're doing fintech, computational analytics that we're doing computational accounting and then data analytics. And we're doing things in fintech. We're doing things in cybersecurity. And I, and I, and I find that great, because the only perception right now uh, in terms of Nigeria and cybersecurity is that people trying to run a fraud or a scam on you. Well, we're also going to produce people that can help people detect and take apart those scams. And the biggest threat uh, to world economies, quite frankly, are the threats that come in through cybersecurity. These programs are not done uh, that prevalently uh, in the African continent in general, in Nigeria in particular. Brilliant. Just very quickly, talking about, I was just going back to the leadership conversation. Yes. So whilst you have such a distinguished set of leaders, it's yes. chaired actually by Professor Fabian Ajogu, SAN. Mm. And you know, alongside that. that. You've done your homework. I love like this. You've done your <laughs> alongside homework. Alongside that, with you know, Dr. Daria Woshika, Tokini, Ms. Tokini Peter's side, you have Mr. Uche Wigwe, and, and you know, so many other phenomenal Nigerians. Okay. Yeah. So it's been said in some quarters that the Wigwe University is only for children of the rich uh, and all of that. Uh, you know, how can in intelligent but very indigent yes. children benefit you know, from this university? The next Einsteins and the next uh, <sighs> Philippe Megualis of this world. So this is, a, this is very personal to myself because um, I, I don't know how intelligent I was, but I was definitely one of those indigenous children mm. that needed a hand up to attend university. I come from a very, uh, we'll just use the word humble, mm. uh, otherwise known as poor uh, background. And it was because of university scholarships that I was able to go on to eventually get my doctorate degree and do the postdoctorate work at some well-known institutions. I say that because we have intentionally set aside 10% of our student population will be on scholarship. It's designed for the indigenous. Uh, one of the challenges, if I may be so bold as to say this, uh, one of the challenges that faces Nigeria is the division that takes place uh, among some on different levels. And I won't go into that, but you're shaking your head so you know what I'm talking about. So what we want to do is bridge that division intentionally. We want to bring everybody uh, to Wigwe University. We want, we want people from the north. We want people from the south, the south-south, as I've oh, learned, okay. the southeast, the southwest. Yeah. We want Muslims. We want Christians. We want people to come together for one Nigeria. So everyone welcome to Wigwe University. Is welcome, Thank including you. those without resources, yeah. because we will make a way. Uh, so there have been uh, governors 
and institutions that have promised to sponsor students that will come. That's we will have 10% of our students that will come there. Yeah. So it is not Thank just for the so rich. It, this, 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 this is not a rich babysitting club. Yeah. This, is, this is a place of educational. And again, what happens in the classroom is only part of your education. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a total education. Thank you so much, yes. Professor Miles yes. Davis. Thank you. We Thank have you for to having go me out here. of Thank time. You. I love we had it. such a great conversation. Yeah, you're with invited you to our commencement. We want to see you down we there. We look forward to that. <laughs> it's Bring in River it State, isn't Thank it? You. We look forward to Thank them to you. come yes. along. Thank right. you. Thank you. Be well. It's time now for a short break on The Morning Show. When we return, we'll have a Rise News analyst, Emmanuel Efeni, join us to review top stories in today's newspapers. Stay with us. Hello, my name is Odumba Tayo. I was once a stylist, but I wasn't having much passion in it because I was forced to do that. And the only person I understand my feeling was my church pastor who introduced me into this training that's um, Afro Fidelity and helped me to apply for it. And it was just like a dream come true for me. My name is Engineer Joy Obi, popularly known as Lady Benz Auto Mechanic, Nigeria first female Mercedes Benz specialist. I met F Fidelity a, a year ago to partner with me and partnering with Fidelity has been a very huge relief for me. There's a lot of people out there who actually want to acquire these skills but they don't have the opportunity. Platforms such as this provide the opportunity to drive the necessary conversations around promoting a world free of gender bias. We are Fidelity. We keep our As a player, there's nothing better than the roar of your crowd. But in Nigeria, there's a roar that may not be heard again. With fewer than 50 lions left, they could be extinct in the next few years. From loss of habitat and prey, and snares set for illegal bushmeat. So please, say no to illegal bushmeat. Let's keep the roar alive for Nigeria. Because poaching steals from us all. Knowledge is power. Information is currency. Trust us to tell you what you need to hear. Welcome to the program. You're with Arise News in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. Breaking news, exclusive interviews, unrivaled analysis. It's you, the audience, who drives our agenda. We tell the stories that inform you, the stories that are important to you, and the stories that are about you. We are not every news channel. We are Arise News. Show right here on the Rise News Channel. Joining us now to review some of today's headlines of top newspapers from around the world is a Rise News analyst, Emmanuel Malabite Efeni, the great Malabito. Good morning, Rufai. Good morning, Ayo. Good morning, Good morning Viba. Good morning, Mr. Yes, we'll start the review with this day, Nigeria's newspaper of record. The lead story shares strike landmark deal to sell all onshore Nigerian oil assets for $2.8 billion. 
consortium of four local firms, one foreign company, to take over operations. Access includes 15 onshore, three shallow water oil mining leases of 458 million barrels. Share to focus on deep water integrated gas operations. Yes, after 60 years, over 60 years of operations in Nigeria, Shell, the oil, global oil giant, is exiting onshore facilities, is onshore facilities in Nigeria, is onshore assets. And, of course, four Nigerian companies, I think that should put some smiles on our faces, and one foreign companies constituting the Renaissance Energy Consortium uh, that will be taking over these assets. Well, you can see the photographs on front page of uh, this day. These are the men behind uh, the consortium. Uh, these are Nigerians. Of course, there's one foreign firm as part of that consortium. Yes, Shell will be divesting no, $1.3 billion and expects uh, to receive additional $1.1 billion. Well, is Shell li living in Nigeria? Well, they are still very much in the deep uh, water exploration and exploitation of oil, where perhaps you say that's where the money is now, because a lot of reasons have been adduced for why these oil majors are leaving Nigeria or diversing from their onshore assets. The other day, uh, it was Ajip that sold its assets to Oando. Why is parent company, ENI, all of Italy, getting uh, OPL two for five? That very controversial, but very rich in oil. That's a license. So what is the reason? Well, those who know in the industry say, well, these companies are not just uh, being nice by handing over to Nigerian. Well, compared to what they have taken over time from these onshore assets, eh, perhaps it's not quite as viable as they think, as they want, uh, to put it in another way, as they want compared to what they've been getting in the past. And so they are exiting and concentrating their efforts in deep waters. But kudos to those Nigerians who are behind these um, deal. It's a big deal, really. And the Guardian newspaper also talking about um, divestment of oil majors. Federal government uh, opts for conditional divestment as oil majors trade $4.5 billion assets. Yes, not just this. Others have taken, other deals have taken place in the past. And according to the story from, from the Guardian, the federal government also for conditional divestment as oil majors divest $4.5 billion assets. Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulation Commission subjects Seplat Oando Renaissance to scrutiny. Amnesty International raises concerns over Shell's unresolved pollution. Asset dumping complicates Nigeria's macroeconomic uncertainty, onshore fiscal terms in Nigeria. Harsh, the letter says. Well, a peep on why these oil companies are leaving uh, their onshore assets. Of course, they will not have to deal with community issues which they have had over time. But communities are part of the equation. They bear the brunt of oil exploration, especially when it is not done according to world best practices. Now, we look at other stories. The Nigerian Tribune newspaper. Explosion rock section of Ibadan. Security men flood part of Bodija estate. Many injured rush to UCH other hospitals. Vibration from blast felt across cities. Yes, our correspondent on the ground, Olufemi um, Cole, right? Tayo Olufemi Cole has been reporting live from the ancient city of Ibadan, giving us all the details, quite a devastating 
explosion um, being attributed to those who stockpiled um, explosives they used for mining, legal or illegal mining. Well, perhaps some job there for the Minister of uh, Solid Minerals to ensure that people mine legally and the Minister ensures that they do so in a safe way. But our sympathies goes to those families who have lost their lives and some are still missing, as it were. And that story is also on the front page of New Telegraph newspaper, Pandemonium as massive explosion rock a burden. Vanguard newspaper, massive explosion rock a burden. Vanguard newspaper. Now, um, the Nation newspaper, President raises red alert over rising banditry kidnapping. Tinubu demands concrete action from service chiefs. IG Wiki swing into action about time uh, because this is a very worrisome development in the country with kidnapping assuming an epidemic proportion. Yes, and that's the term coined by the Punch newspaper. Abduction epidemic. Anti kidnapping protest holds in Abuja today as 10 suspects arrested. Tinubu's vow crackdown on kidnappers, agents of darkness, abductors, kill hotel barman. Well, impact of the kidnapping uh, epidemic, the Business Day newspaper is reporting that kidnap plague threatens Tinubu's food security plan. Fear grips Abuja residents as criminals hold sway. President promises to eliminate every agent of darkness. Well, Still on the national security, the Daily Trust reporting, despite multi-billion Naira complex, NSA's office commits 32 billion Naira to a new building. Its misplacement of priority CSO's experts. Well, the president yesterday, again, meeting with the service chiefs, familiar optics, killings, service chief someone to Aso Villa, the moving in file, present giving machine order, and we hope the service chiefs. Matter. Now, if we just look at the foreign newspaper quickly. Now, the Daily Telegraph newspaper, 60 Tories turn on on. Prime Minister in Rwanda rebellion. Yes, Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister of UK, facing his biggest test yet. And he faced that defeat yesterday as uh, the deputy chairman, two deputy chairmen of uh, his party quit to vote against the bill on Rwanda. And they are tightening the news on that bill to make it more difficult for that sending migrants to Rwanda to be difficult. And the Guardian newspaper also reporting that story. Prime Minister, Prime Minister faces revolt on Rwanda plans as senior Tories quit. Rufai Ayo Vembae. Mm. All right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Fenning, for your time. But we'll have to go because of time. It's time for a short break now. When we return, we'll have Oji Okwe to join us here with details of what's training. Stay with us. Guy, with the rising cost of things, we need to plan our next move. Guy, I agree with you. I mean, with the money we make, we should not be struggling with our finances now. Maybe you both need better banking options. What do you know about better banking options? <laughs> I recently moved my salary account to Polaris Bank, and since then, it's been a smooth ride for me. They bought over my existing loan and gave me better interest rates and repayment terms. Are you serious? Yes, as a Polaris salary account holder, I can get personal term loan, auto loan, mortgage, 50% salary advance, credit card, and more without going to the bank. Really? 
I've got a personal term loan already. See, here's my credit card too. How do I make the move? Simple. Open a Polaris salary account on Vault. Use salary account as your referral code. My guy, I am moving my salary accounts now, now. Get personal term loan and more with your Polaris salary account. Vault is available on Google Play Store and Apple App Store. Salary and You're watching Arise, the world's standout news channel. Proudly independent for more than a decade. Always bold, always fresh. Winner of several awards, local and global. Winner of TV Channel of the Year from peers at the Broadcasting Organizations of Nigeria Awards. Winner of an Emmy from America's National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. Still, we're changing the conversation to make sense of your world. We'll do it together, because now more than ever, you need a clear voice to guide you home. Arise News, Awards and Beyond. Welcome back to the morning show right here on the Rise News Channel. Joining us now is Oji Okpe with stories trending around the one action, the, the world. world. You know, we'll try world. to treat more Nigerian stories today. How about okay. that? Good morning, Dr. Oji. I Dr. sense Dr. No, 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 no. <laughs> I always come in peace. Says, the only thing is I didn't wear white today, but I come in peace uh, as always. You know that, Rufai. The day you don't wear white. <laughs> <laughs> you want to give them a white wash. <laughs> this man, this man. How are you, Ayo, this Good. morning? <laughs> you know, it looks like a dove you're wearing, so that's enough peace. Oh, I love this no. woman. <laughs> well, I'm seeing your favorite Nigerian wife. Oh, yeah, still dove. I know green hair. No green hair. Hey, no it green. will last just a few more days, just so you guys know. I, 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 I just wanted to do the no green for a moment. But how about that? We love it. Well, all right. Well, let's begin what's trending. On Tuesday, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu extolled his predecessor, Muhammad Buhari, during the unveiling ceremony of two books titled Working with Buhari and Muhammad Buhari, The Nigerian Legacy, saying that he served Nigeria with dedication and uncommon zeal. Tinubu also praised the authors of the book, one of which was written by Buhari's former special advisor, Femi Adeshina, saying that they have done justice to the essential of Muhammadu Buhari, especially on his tenure and legacy as the 15th president of Nigeria. You have seen office at a very difficult time in our nation. Slide. The economy was prying into recession. Boko Haram has taken over so many local governments and some part of our country. It is easy to forget that United Nations building was attacked here in Abuja. It's easy to forget the role of armed forces. But if this book is carefully read and taught in terms of substance in our various schools, the job of securing the in every inch of our nation may not be completed, but you did a wonderful job. Well, Tinubu there saying Buhari did a wonderful job. Well, in the meantime, the former president, while speaking at his first public appearance since leaving office, expressed deep gratitude 
to those who supported him during his presidency, including President Tinubu. Buhari also highlighted the challenges faced by his administration and apologized for the tough de decisions taken during his tenure, while affirming his unwavering belief in the nation's future. Our journey to the desired destination, there will be hard decisions taken, and the people would bear some costs. We can only seek their understanding and state that there was no intention to deliberately inflict pain and anguish on anyone. This is why I apologize to such people at the end of our time in office. Sacrifices are still being made now and will continue to be part of our national life and development. All right, Rufai, we're seeing former president uh, there apologizing for some tough decisions that he made. You know, last night I watched his uh, uh, former advisor, Femi Adeshina, on Newsnight, and he talked about, you know, how the president did a wonderful job. But if you recall, I mean, during, uh, you know, at the time, uh, President Buhari had, you know, put in so many different policies that, you know, caused a lot of hardship in our nation, including, you know, importation, banning, uh, you know, imported goods, which, you know, affected some sectors as well. But also, we had uh, President Tinubu here saying that, you know, Buhari did a wonderful job. In the meantime, we are hearing that he inherited a bankrupt economy. There is an American band. I'm a lover of rock music and pop music. There's an American band called One Republic that sang a song. And the song goes thus, it's too late to apologize. It's too late. Yeah, it's too late to apologize. It's too late. You're not accepting the apology, Rufai? No. Really? No. Okay. Tell us why. And I'll tell you why. President Buhari came in 2015 with a lot of ex with a lot of expectations. In 2015, if you shouted "Say Baba," it was like a tribe, like a cult. Everybody loved that man. I loved him to bits and pieces. Everybody thought he was going to change things. But what did he do? He disappointed Nigeria. It took him six months before he gave us ministers. He took the state of growth the government of the PDP had then, and he truncated it. The value of the Naira then, they were saying they were going to bring from one dollar to one Naira, was about 200 now. They pushed it to about over 400 and something. Now it's gone over 1,000. The APC administration, over going to, after eight years now, has been one that has really dampened the courage of Nigerians in their country. When Buhari came in, he came in with the mantra that he was a general, he was going to fight insecurity and all of that. But insecurity increased. We had banditry and everything under him. He made some successes, don't get me wrong. Mm. He did a lot of projects, but there were many corruption allegations also in his administration. And people are checking what is even the cost of the project. He said he did. He took this economy, shut it down on his feet. He shut our borders in the process of trying to get right people to buy more Nigerian rice and all of that. Yes, yeah, some local production happened, but what happened? Inflation came. Many a hazard economy. At some point, he kept on blaming the fact that we're not getting enough forex. When the Ukraine war started, that we had a lot more money, what happened? Nothing. He printed 27 trillion in ways and means, and he kept on printing money that we cannot justify. He put our economy in this quagmire we are in today. I love Nigerians feel the pain for it. Today, a thousand a, a dollar is over a thousand naira. A pound sterling is going to one thousand six or seven hundred naira. He left an economy in shambles. President Tinubu keeps complaining about it. Yes. His problem is so much that President Tinubu can't even take the fall for him. He has to say every time that it is you that caused the corruption. Yes. Under his administration, he set up a humanitarian ministry that has become a cesspit for corruption today. Right. A minister under his administration is now going to the EFCC to give account. After all of this, you're saying tough decisions. President Buhari, you didn't think through those decisions when you made them. And that's why I say this morning, it's too late to apologize because the damage has been done. Mm. The Nigeria where we knew in 2015 that had a vibrant economy that was an investor's hub for Africa is no longer the Nigeria we know today. Right. And you started the process of the damage you take accountability and responsibility. 
But as children of God, we'll take your apology, but it's too late to apologize. <laughs> okay. I assure you, yes. it's too late. Well, Rafai has uh, taken his apology, but, you know, uh, still saying it's too late. You made mention of the insecurity. Yes. And obviously, President Tinubu also inherited that insecurity. But you saw him there, you know, praising Buhari, saying at the time he took over the government, there was, you know, all the bombing, bombings in Abuja and terrorism reduced a lot. Well, in another development... President Bola Ahmed Tinubu has condemned the recent spate of kidnappings and bandit attacks, describing the development as disturbing, ungodly, and sinister. The president made the comment when he received a delegation of Jimiatu Asaruddin, a highly respected Islamic movement at the State House in Abuja on Tuesday. President Tinubu said while security agencies are acting with dispatch to immediately address the current challenge, all required resources, policies, and plans will be rolled out soon for massive education of Nigerian youth. The president said education is the antidote to the troubles agitating or ailing the nation, adding that there is no weapon against poverty that is potent as learning. I think that this was a very, you know, valid point President Tinubu has made. Education, we need to see how this will be implemented, though. Even during the book launch, he also talked about the fact that, you know, history was taken out of our, you know, curriculum. He would like to have, you know, these books written for uh, President uh, Buhari uh, included in our curriculum. Well, in the same vein, the Supreme Council of Sharia in Nigeria on Tuesday provoked a fresh controversy on the Muslim-Muslim ticket of the All Progressives Congress for the 2023 election, which is said has fallen short of expectation. The president of the Sharia group gave the verdict. In an interview with journalists during a national conference held in Abuja, he said, despite the enormous support received by the president during the election, Nigerians have not enjoyed dividends of democracy. The president went further to state that the group campaigned and supported Tinubu until he came into power, but that now they are suffering. <laughs> well, um, Ayo, before I come to you, I mean, you see these groups now saying that they supported Tinubu and they are suffering. But, you know, education is one way of solving the insecurity. Absolutely. But also, you know, earlier we took the story of the Lagos Trust Fund, which will bring me to my next story, about state governors doing what they need to do to ensure security in their various states. Well, in the meantime... The governor of Kaduna State, Uba Sani, announced plans to establish a security trust fund to confront all emerging and reoccurring security challenges in the state. The governor spoke on Tuesday at the Kaduna Core Security Council meeting with traditional rulers and local government chairmen of frontline areas. The government is looking at the possibility of establishing the Kaduna State Security Trust Fund as a means of collaborating with corporate organizations, the business community, industrialists, professional groups, individuals, and all critical stakeholders toward enhancing material and logistic support to our security forces. A great way to tackle insecurity. Kudos to the Kaduna State Governor. Remember when we took the story for Lagos State, we encouraged yes. other states to emulate or to adopt the same measures as the Lagos Trust Fund, one way to tackle insecurity. I also believe Uba Sani has been really good in even just, you know, having yes. vigilantes. He empowered about 7,000 young people, you know, to try to help them, you know, curb yeah. the uh, menace in Kaduna State. Yeah, I think uh, this um, um, Governor Uba Sani has shown or demonstrated his seriousness to tackle what had um, beleaguered the past administration in terms of bringing Southern and Northern Kaduna together and tackling incessant attacks, especially in the Southern part of Kaduna. Through soft measures and you know, hard measures or more obvious measures, I will never forget where we spoke about him going, attending a Christmas carol um, service in one of the churches in the Southern part of Kaduna, just to show by his body language that he meant business. And as the first citizen of the state, he was interested in leading the people to live together more peacefully. Very powerful message message there. So he's been doing the right things in terms of his commitment to promote, promoting um, security in Kaduna State. And I must say that it is important because last administration was terrible. 
with security in Kaduna State. It was one news after the other of whether abductions, attacks on one community or the other, with just little or nothing seen to address that. So I must give him kudos for that. Also, this is a great call um, that we made with regards to other states um, following or towing the line of the Lagos State Security um, Trust Fund, which Mr. Femi Otedola had donated $1 billion to the other time. So I'm hoping that the Kaduna citizens will also donate money to yes. this security trust fund. It's one thing to establish it. It's another thing for it to thrive because people, private citizens or corporate organizations buy into that idea. It's worked in Lagos State, other states should emulate. Now let me go back to the story with regards to President Tinubu talking about education when the um, Muslim group came to see him or went to see him, you know, showing concern for the security situation in Nigeria. And he spoke very well. We've talked about it a number of times. Analysts have said it's the remote and immediate causes of security or the rise in terrorism, banditry, kidnapping. Poverty has been highlighted as one of its. The former vice president, Atiku Abubakar, said this following the kidnapping situations in Abuja. Uh, education, lack of it, especially in the northern part of Nigeria. It's not surprising that the place or the area that's most plagued with insecurity has the largest number of out-of-school children in Nigeria. And guess what? The insecurity situation further exacerbates the situation because if you can't protect students in schools, then parents are not encouraged to send the children to school anyway. But he said something very important, and I totally agree with that, that they must teach, whether through the Islamic way or through formal education, the people and people of their faith that kidnapping is not in the, is not in the Quran. Mm -hmm. um, killing people or shedding of blood is not the way of the prophet. You know, it's not, they, they must teach the truth because some people twist religion on either side of the divide. Whichever religious belief you have can be twisted to the very extreme. So I like that he's drawing them in as well to take responsibility right. when it comes to education, both religious education and formal education as an antidote or one of the ant antidotes to, you know, addressing um, insecurity. Now, going to the Sharia group who say that they are not happy. No, no, it doesn't have any, as not yet, there's no, no time yet. Is it's it not, too late it's, No, 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 it's eight months. To, no, no, okay. they cannot, no, they should start. They should We've still seen some okay. people, even on social media, going up and saying, oh, we must, I mean, you have your right to change your mind at any time, but it also shows and demonstrates that before you support or back something, yes. think through it. Absolutely. We're playing along religious sentiments and lines during election when it favored them. Now it's not favoring them anymore. It just shows that people are selfish. Yes. Everyone is looking out for their own interest. Mm -hmm. Now it's not favoring them anymore. They're now saying, oh, yeah, no, 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 no. No, it, can, it has to be based on ideological um, concepts or the fact that they thought it was great for the nation, right. not just for a particular group. Absolutely. I, I'm just I, like, I love that. Well, no. well, well, well said. That's us love on him. Well, no. said. well, all right. Shall we take another story? It's for you, Vimbai. Following up on the scandal that has rocked the humanitarian ministry, which led to the suspension of its minister, Dr. Beta Edu, the minister was said to have received the sum of 3 billion naira of COVID 19 funds for the verification of the National Social Register. Well, in a letter dated September 18th, 2023, Femi Bajia Miller, the chief of staff to the president, told Beta Edu that her request to obtain the 3 billion naira from the COVID-19 funds had been approved by the president. The 3 billion naira was reportedly dispersed to nine companies, including one linked to Olubumi Tunjiojo, Minister of Interior. The approval letter from the chief of staff has now elicited more reactions. Vimbai, this letter, you know, is coming at the same time, you know, that panel has been set up to investigate the um, NSIA. But, you know, um, the issue here is about that COVID-19 um, funds. I mean, back in 2020, the World Bank had issued $114 million to Nigeria. And also, even the central bank issued 100 million Naira credit. And, you know, we saw a lot of looting at the time. If you can pull up some of those videos where Nigerians were saying we are suffering, where is the money? But at the time, they also asked the accountant general of the federation to account for those funds. And now we are seeing that the 3 billion Naira, uh, yeah, that's the video, the 3 billion Naira was issued for verification of the social register. I mean, this is absurd at this point. Oh, gee, this is, it, this is devastating at the least because there's so many layers to the story, so many layers to it. Like you rightfully said, it's 2023. Mm -hmm. 
you, our suffering is now, you know, induced by other factors. But in 2020, 2021, at the height of the impact that was caused to businesses, people, property, so, people suffered during 2020 because, I mean, COVID, it wasn't anything anybody could have planned for. And then to now discover that there's three billion that was hanging out somewhere yeah. in an account and is now available to redo because the social register had been done, it was but done. there was a choice to redo it is another, another question when there are more pressing matters on the ground. And then secondly, it is now part of the, these funds are now being transferred to a minister of interior who is not, no longer a director in the business, but we all know the complexities of the story. Uh, so now the question here is, what is going to happen to the minister of interior? Uh, because, we, you know, we, we've seen better Edu. She's being investigated. Kudos for that. We need to see this investigation expand mm -hmm. uh, to all who are, are named here so that they can also clear the names, yes. their names. They need to be given an opportunity to clear their names. Right. Uh, and, you know, to, to, to end off, uh, you know, in international relations, they always like to say there are no permanent friends, only permanent interests. Mm -hmm. I know Better Edu's media aide is saying that this is all part of blackmail. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it just goes to show you that when the chips are down, like, like Ayo was saying just now, it all comes down to personal interests. Yes. And it all comes down to people trying to save their necks and clear their names. Well, if that's what it's going to take to sanitize, uh, you know, corruption in right. various departments, then please leak. Let the leakage just yes, continue. Yes, we it, want to see absolutely. more documents leaking. More documents. Yes. <laughs> one leak memo after another. A quick sentence from you on this story so that we can very take our final. I have loved the real spread on yes. this because this is a very critical issue. But very. quickly, uh, Olu, Olu, Olu Bumiojo was supposed to be at CCB yesterday. He yes. couldn't make it because he has another engagement. They, I think they fixed another date for him. He should be there. Also, the Chief of Staff, Mr. Bajabi Amila, should be able to yes. make more explanation as regards this COVID-19. You see, these are part of the thing. When Buhari was saying we should forgive him, do you know most of these monies were printed? They were not monies we had. They were the monies CPM printed. That's part of the things causing inflation in the country today. Mm -hmm. And you see the way they squandered it. Humanitarian ministry, all sorts of... Had, you are talking about the Accountant General of the last administration. Was that not the man that was caught in a corruption scandal, yeah. over 100 billion? For the past eight years now, most Accountant General has been caught in corruption. The one under good luck, Jonathan, too, was caught in corruption. No, we it's like a point in chalice. So we, so, so we keep having these things, and it goes on. We are printing money, they are squandering it. In about six months, and you can see the corruption allegation, and some people that we're very begotted enough when we're calling, when we're talking about these things in this country, thought it was about religion. They pushed everything, Muslim. You can see, Nigeria's problem is not about that. Mm -hmm. It's about leaders having the heart to do well for the people. And the problem is, we don't have checks and balances in place that make the leader have the heart for the people. Yeah. You can see when Lagosians were protesting, no palliative for them to eat. Apparently, the humanitarian ministry is not answering questions. When Absolutely. we're saying, how would you give school feeding program during COVID-19 when schools were not open? Absolutely. They said our mouth was smelly. Yes. But whose mouth is smelly today? I mean, look That's at the that. kind of country we've built. And when we say it, somebody sits up there and say, I apolo apologize for what? <laughs> when people died because of this. People were robbed by one million boys during COVID-19 because of this. It's unfortunate. Three billion So naira please, the chief of fund. staff needs to explain. Yes. Accountant General yes. needs to explain. All of them. The chief of staff needs to explain about this. Absolutely. In 2020, quickly. the federal government took a facility of $500 million to execute the National Social Register and cash transfers. We so we spent it. money then to do this social register. Now I spend another three billion hour to verify. Unfortunate. Just to let Nigeria, because that was a loan, for, so I'm not sure we've paid back the $500 million. And we're already spending more money to do in a, in a very, no, so, so we, we need to understand the scope of the problem and that every penny ought to be accounted for. Absolutely. $500 million, and 2020, or 20, what happened to that? We well, need to ask right. questions. Well said. All right, we shall take our final story then. The National Orientation Agency has issued a strict warning to the Olu of Owode Egba, Oba Aremo Showorimimo, for abusing Naira notes in a viral video. The monarch was seen spraying wads of Naira notes on musician Wasiu Ainde Marshall.
popularly known as Kwam Won during the 13th anniversary of his ascension to the royal stool. The agency said the display was an abuse of the national currency, which attracts imprisonment, fines, or both. Well, let's take a look at that video before we come back for a discussion. By Ayo Rufai. I, I don't think I've ever seen um, that type of spraying before. Rufai, is this your monarch? I mean, I know no, you're from uh, no, 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 Ogun State. But I mean, we have been talking thing. about this over and over again. It is against the law. This type of Naira plunking is unacceptable. I, um, I know you are from Zimbabwe. Sorry, do you guys do this in your country? <laughs> do you know what? Funny enough, we're trying to eliminate yeah, 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 you know, Nigeria is Africa's giant. So somebody yes. in Zimbabwe right now is stringing together, stringing our, together. our worthless dollars. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right. Well, what, let's hope that the monarch has heard and, you know, we'll desist from that type of practice. Well, I'd love to thank you all for your great analysis, as always, on what's trending. Well, that's all I have for you on What's Trending today. I'll see you all tomorrow. I should say, Arji, Vimbai, Aya, all of you fabulous. Oh, that's Rufai all on this edition angels. of The Morning Show. <laughs> I'm Bisola Owolawi. We'll be here to take you through Global Business Report. Stay with us. Forget the modern elevators, the unaspiring escalators. We're about to turn taking the stairs into a training fitness adventure that will leave you feeling invincible. The stairs aren't just for getting from point A to point B. They are personal fitness playground. By choosing the stairs, we're not only improving our well-being, but also reducing our carbon footprint. According to a research by Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, it is estimated that an average elevator ride contributes 0.15 to 0.3 kilograms of carbon dioxide emission per trip. And taking the stairs, therefore, just gives you zero carbon emission. So lace up those sneakers, embrace the challenge, and transform the stairs into a personal playground of fun and fitness. So let's make a positive impact on the environment together. Let us take you on a journey towards the fearless pursuit of knowledge. Navigating uncharted territories and taking bold, fearless steps towards a future shaped by courage and discovery as young, ambitious minds begin their quest for learning at a university. Pulling together people of diverse backgrounds to build a fearless generation that will change the future of our country and our continent. Wigwe University awaits a testament to the power of education and unwavering spirit of those who dare to be fearless. Wigwe University, where the fearless make history. Now open for admission into the 2024-2025 session. I'm 19. I've been modeling for 
a year and a half now. Naomi has managed to juggle both her education and her modeling career perfectly well. Now in her final year in university, the budding model cannot wait to take the industry by storm. The show to start already and like next model like walk and I just want to have that feeling musical. So in Europe, we go for individual castings for those designers, and some people can get up to 15 shows, and you might get just one or nothing at all. So I think it's it's healthy competition. Agatha honed her craft and soon was cast to walk the Arise Fashion Week twice in a row. This is the second time I did the first show 2019. I'm working for Arise 2020, and I'm so excited. To get to the top, like being among the top models in Nigeria, they're kind of the most difficult thing in the industry. So it's actually very difficult. So it has to do with you being persistent and you being courageous as a model. It's been fun. It's been hectic, stressful, but I think every fashion week you look forward to a lot of things and it's been fun so far. Since 2018, 2019 to date, I've always await a rise fashion week. What is Arise going to do for my career as a fashion model? It's going to do a lot. It's going to place me on an international level. Because Arise is one of the biggest fashion shows in Africa. Happy New Year from us to you. Arise Play. Welcome to Arise News. You're watching the Global Business Report, and I'm Abby Olawi coming to you from Nigeria's commercial capital, Lagos. Let's take a look at some of the stories currently making headlines across the business world today. UK inflation unexpectedly rises to 4% in December as cost of tobacco and alcohol jumps. Plus, China's economy expands by 5.2% in 2023, its slowest rate in more than three decades, according to official figures. Then we bring you a special interview with the Governor of the Reserve Bank of South Africa, Lesetia Hanya Ho, at the World Economic Forum in Davos. And in Nigeria, Renaissance Africa Energy to acquire Shell stake in SBDC in a landmark $2.4 billion deal. More details on these shortly. Stay tuned. British inflation unexpectedly accelerated in December on tobacco duty hikes, data showed on Tuesday. Missing expectations were slowed down and dimming hopes of an interest rate cut. The Consumer Prices Index climbed to 4% last month, the first increase since February 2023, the Office of National Statistics declared in a statement. That has doubled the Bank of England's official target of 2% and dashed market expectations for a slowdown to 3.8%. China's economy last year grew at one of its slowest rates in more than three decades, official figures showed on Wednesday, as it was battered by a crippling property crisis, sluggish consumption and global turmoil. The figures were in line with expectations and even beat Beijing's target, but will likely pile fresh pressure on officials to unveil new stimulus measures to kickstart business activity and get the country's army of consumers spending again. China's National Bureau of Stats revealed that gross domestic product expanded 5.2% to hit 126 trillion yuan last year. Now it's the third day of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. And here at Arise News, we've been keeping you abreast with activities at the forum. Joining us now to update on what's the agenda today is Rolake Akinkube Fulani and Rotus Odiri. Good morning, Rolake and Rotus. It's great to see you both. 
Good morning, Good morning, Abby. Great to be speaking to you, Abby. Absolutely. A lot's happening there, Michelle. But let's begin with you, Rolike. What can you tell us about the tech fund launched by uh, the United Nations Development Programme? Yes, this is really, really big news, Abby. I'm super excited about this. And the reason I'm super excited is because about 89% of the venture capital that comes into Africa comes from foreign investors. So what the UNDP and African leaders have done is to launch a $1 billion tech fund called the Timbuktu Fund. And the idea is to accelerate investment in the African startup ecosystem. Present at that launch were President Paul Kagame of Rwanda, President Nana Akufuado of Ghana, the UNDP administrator, Achim Snyder, and of course, Dr. Bosun Tijani was also present at that, uh, uh, Minister for ICT was also present at that launch. So it's, it's a really welcome development. It will also feature the establishment of what is called unipods, which are locations across different countries in Africa. So big news there for the African continent. I think this is a really strategic and timely partnership to enable and drive the growth of tech funds on the African continent who are creating innovation. But beyond that, highlight the fact that we have local sources of capital here and regional sources of capital within Africa to scale our tech sector. Certainly a very refreshing and important development there. And what better time if we put it that way as well. I'm sure lots to unfold and you will keep us abreast as we know a lot more that unfolds from there. But let's come to you, Rotus. We of course saw that China's uh, Premier disclosed, disclosed 2023 GDP figures yesterday in Davos ahead of schedule that was confirmed today by the Bureau of Stats. How do we interpret China's GDP growth? And more importantly, what are the challenges facing the second largest economy in the world? Yeah, Abby, there are big challenges. Um, first off, Li Qiang, I, I, announcing this ahead of schedule here in Davos, kind of suggests that he's trying to bring some confidence to Chinese economy, to international investors. So they met estimates of 5.2%, but that was really because of base effects, because of where China was in 2021. As far as the main challenges that China is facing, it's deflation is one of them. Prices keep on falling. And if prices keep on falling, people are going to hold back on spending, which is going to have an impact on economic growth. Also, China's property sector. We have repeatedly on Arise News reported on country garden, missing bond payments, and all the issues, the downgrading from the credit agencies, of China's property sector and what that means in terms of bearish sentiment for a lack of investment coming in there, debt and so on and so forth. Third is China's falling population. Should China continue to expand infrastructure when your population is falling? Should you instead, as analysts at Morgan Stanley and others have said, focus on welfare payments and stimulus that is going to bring the economy up? So those are the main challenges China is facing. There's also, of course, the U.S. restriction on chip exports to China. The Netherlands, Japan, other countries are chiming in and assisting them in doing that. Um, so there's the geopolitical concerns as well. It's all that comes together. China is still in a very tight space. We're going to see how they do this year. But again, Li Kang here in Davos trying to reassure investors that China can rebound in 2024. Right. Some very cogent points and issues there facing China. And of course, you know, we're, the world's eyes are pilled to see what comes up because that's a very important and mon monumental conversation. Well, Rotus and Rollercare, keep holding uh, the fort over there. Of course, you're keeping warm and we'll be seeing you again very soon. All right. During an exclusive interview with Arise Business Correspondent Rotus Oderi on the sidelines of the World Economic Forum in Davos, the governor of the Reserve Bank of South Africa, Lesetia Hanyaho, praised the Afrexim Bank's Pan-African Payment Settlement System, but also said liquidity to boost Pan-African trade rests with the central banks. Let's take a look. So most all um, uh, of those, um, both leadership and institutions, and institutions becomes very important. And since we are in Davos and we're talking about institutions, uh, we should be talking about international institutions. And um, what is uh, very important here is that uh, you have got a, a global economic system, and I would restrict myself to the economic institution rather than the political uh, ones. Uh, but I think if we are to rebuild trust, we must restore confidence in the multilateral system that the problems that face us as a global community require multilateral uh, solutions. And so when the world was faced with um, the 
great financial crisis and it had to be resolved. And uh, we came together and uh, that is what led to the elevation of the G20, for example, to the heads of state. And there was a concerted program uh, to have um, global standards on regulations that are, they are set so that we would be able to build a resilient financial sector. In 2020, the world was hit by a pandemic. And again, with the world being hit by a pandemic, we needed to respond. And we knew that with the pandemic, none of us is safe unless all of us are safe. And so we had to deal with the challenge that was facing humanity. And it was almost an existential crisis for uh, for humanity. And yet, countries in the developing world didn't have the resources uh, to respond to, um, uh, to the pandemic. And part of it was that when we experienced the crisis in 2008, there was a feeling that we needed a well-resourced IMF, we wanted well-resourced multilateral development banks so that we would be able to respond to that crisis and any future crises. A decision was taken to avail only temporary resources because this thing w will not happen again. Of course it didn't happen again. What happened was COVID-19 and that COVID-19 meant that once again the global community was caught up with an IMF that was under-resourced and the multilateral development banks that were under-resourced and thus couldn't respond to the needs of developing uh, countries. And so it looks like every time the world gets spared into serious action, there must be a crisis. Unfortunately, eventually, the IMF uh, got the resources that it required. And eventually, last year, um, the approval was made uh, to increase the quotas of the IMF, which are required for uh, to determine the amount of access, the extent of the access that you could have to IMF uh, resources. So also a review of the multilateral development banks and how they can be better resourced uh, uh, so that they would be, respond, uh, be able to respond to this. So if you are to rebuild trust as a global community, we need to restore confidence in multilateral institutions and be seen to be responding evenly uh, to the uh, crisis that uh, we would be facing as a, uh, uh, as a loop. So that would, for me, uh, be a takeaway. And I guess you take it to the African continent, you could say uh, uh, the same thing. Um, uh, conflicts have, have sparked once again on the uh, African continent. What's the role of the continental uh, bodies? So those conflicts are in the political arena. So I'm not going to venture there. Uh, but uh, once again, when we talked about that resourcing, we wanted to ask ourselves, we've got African financial, multilateral financial institutions like the African Development Bank. Um, what are the lessons? Did we think that the African Development Bank was adequately resourced to be able to deal with the, uh, 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 the pandemic? If, if not, when we consider additional resources for all of these multilateral development banks, we have got also to think about how the African Development Bank as a continental institution uh, could be uh, could be resourced. Uh, but you talked about trust and you're talking about trust and one of the things that we have in, in the African continent was that we created the uh, AFTA and with the Afri African Free Continental Trade uh, uh, Agreement, well, we, if we are going to trade with each other, we got to be having trust in the institutions that might also have to resolve any disagreements that uh, uh, we might have. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement offers massive opportunity to grow African economies, to get African economies to trade with each other, and importantly, uh, to raise the incomes of uh, the African uh, people. Well, trade have got to be settled. When people trade with each other, one must be paid on and, and so forth. And in the Association of African Central Banks, we have got a, a process that we are running to get the African payment systems interconnected. So we have got a payment system that that is uh, based in SADAC in East Africa, there's one in West Africa and so forth, that you've got to get these payment systems to be interoperable so that trade could actually be uh, financed adequately and settled adequately as a result of that. So that would be my take about 
uh, building trust. Mm, fantastic. I, you know, speaking of payments, the, the Afri Exim Bank, the Africa Export Import Bank, is looking at uh, a system called PAPS, mm -hmm. the payments, uh, it's payment settlement system, to where if I was trading with you, I would pay in local Naira, and you would receive your the payment for goods in uh, Rand. Mm -hmm. what, what do you make of a, a platform like that to, to allow local currencies to... to well, we have been asked by the heads of states to, to work together with Afriksim Bank as the uh, central banks. The there are all sorts of configurations uh, in between uh, because part of it is that uh, we have got a payment systems that are currently working and we want them to be interoperable. So you could have them being interoperable or you could try and create something that uh, starts everything from, uh, from scratch. But what is crucial is that payment systems are the responsibilities of central banks. And there is a reason why they are responsibilities uh, of central banks. So if in that payments intercontinental payment system, we run out of Naira. All right, insightful discussion there with Governor of the South African Reserve Bank, Lesetja um, on Yahoo. Uh, but of course, we will share the rest of that with you as the day progresses. But as we continue the coverage of the activities of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Arise correspondents Roda Zuderi and Rolaki Akinkobe Fulani join me now, and they're joined by Boston Tijani, who is Minister of Communications, Innovation and Digital e Economy. It's great to see you again, Rolaki and Rotas, and Honorable Minister Boston Tijani. Yes. Thank you very much, Abby. As you said, we're joined today by the Honorable Minister for ICT and Digital Economy of Nigeria, Dr. Bosna Tijani, here at the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2024. Great to have you with us on the oh, show. Oh, pleasure, Alaka. Great. So I guess my first question is, what has been your take on the theme, Rebuilding Trust, and which sessions have stood out for you and why? Which ones have struck a chord with you? Um, I think the theme is extremely profound, if I can say that. Uh, because we live at a time when our world is a lot more connected and that connectivity means that we can share more widely okay. uh, so which means nothing is truly hidden anymore so mm -hmm. there's that lack of trust between people and you know then people and government as well uh, which means there's much more work for public leaders to mm -hmm. actually help build a society uh, that is a lot more resilient because people don't want to believe what they see out there anymore. <laughs> Indeed. And speaking of trust, you know, one of the initiatives you have is the digitization plan in the public sector. And Absolutely. I think that's a really important element of building trust between the public and the private sector. So can you tell us a bit about that and how you hope it would advance your goals? And I think it's one of those things. So the first thing I noticed uh, after joining government, you know, if you understand my background, was how much innovation was going on within the public sector quite significant that we don't talk about. When you, when you talk innovation in the public space in Africa, uh, things like M-Pesa will come to mind. But no one talks about the Nigerian Interbank Exchange System, which mm -hmm. has more users on it than the M-Pesa. Right? When we talk innovation, you know, people would always look at the negative side of the uh, NIN. You know? But no one is talking about what the NIN is now allowing us to be able to do as a nation. Of course, it was a painful ex exercise. Right? It was a painful exercise. But what we're saying is that when government is extremely intentional with how we use technology to deliver government services, not only do you create opportunity for citizens to actually benefit and access the services, the public services they need, you also create the foundation for private services to be delivered in manners that can actually serve people. Because the core of any society is whether you can identify your people, whether you can provide security, identify properties. Most of those things are services the government will have to create. Education, for instance, public health uh, facilities. These are government services. If you're able to automate those services, not only do they become a lot easier for mm -hmm. citizens to access, you also get to learn more about what is happening because once those services are digitalized, they're connected, you collect data better, real-time information that government can use to, to take informed decision on how you appropriate your small resources that you're constantly struggling with. Mm. And I think we're extremely lucky. People don't talk about this enough. You know, the president was the, one of the first governors in Nigeria to actually uh, digitalize government services in Lagos State. Until today, we can still see that significant portion of public services in Lagos State are, are, are interconnected and they're also available online as well for yeah. those who consume them. So I think we have a unique opportunity to actually invest significantly. Government is giving us that mandate. There are a few things we need to do beyond just digitalizing. What I've seen is these things have been done in silo. 
and when you do them in silo, they look disorganized. Mm. So the, the country actually doesn't truly benefit from a siloed approach to, to digitalization. So we're starting something that we call the digital public infrastructure, which is building the base for that, which is a Nigerian stack that allows us to be able to share data between different services, then making it easy for the president to sit in his office and actually see what is going on in the country. How many child have been given birth to in the last 24 hours? How many people died? You know, what's happening where? Mm -hmm. it, however, it's going to be a long process. Yeah, as long process, but yeah. good initiative. The, um, I mean, for that kind of, for that to work, mm -hmm. I think broadband connectivity Absolutely. is going to be important. Uh, it's under, it's, I think it's about 45% as of the last August 2023 from the NCC. Mm -hmm. um, you had conducted an interview, you had an interview where you said it would cost about $2 billion yeah. to get that going. Absolutely. Rolak has already mentioned in our last segment, this yeah. fund, um, what, how, where's the funding going to come from for that initiative? So we're working hard to put it together and I'm extremely excited at the interest that we're getting. Rolak, you're an investor, so you probably understand how this works. It's infrastructure, so so many people want to be part of it, right? And, and what we're thinking, the government is not going to pay for it. But government will guarantee the loan for private company to actually lay because if government pays, then we don't achieve our objective. Mm -hmm. Not only do we want to secure the fund, we want to ensure that in the next two to three years, a significant part of Nigeria is covered. For those who understand the power of connectivity, you can understand what I would do to our economy. It's significant. It's, it's going to be one of the biggest things I do as a minister, okay. you know, once we're able to achieve that. Because people talk about non-consumption. The reason why we're not there at the minute is, you know, the, the private companies will tell you uh, there are parts of Nigeria that if I invest in infrastructure and if I pull fiber optic cable, there's not enough customers that will pay. But what I've seen is that every state you go has nothing less than a thousand schools, probably over a thousand uh, hospitals. Mm -hmm. that they have uh, government offices. So one of the things we're doing, I released a white paper be before coming here, is to actually help to reduce that non-consumption by looking for a sustainable business model for connecting public institutions. Yeah. Imagine if all the schools in Nigeria are connected. Just imagine the possibilities. Yeah. It's huge, yeah. huge potential. Yeah, huge that, potential. Would, that, that would be very interesting. So, you know, you have a plan, a massive plan Absolutely. for upskilling, yes. <laughs> I think, 3 million so Nigerians. Talent, yeah. And we're seeing the launch of the 3MTT Absolutely. platform, and there's been a fantastic positive response to it. So, so good on the ministry. Now, in terms of ensuring that the upskilling and the skills that are developed, technology skills, can adequately serve the needs of our economy, yeah. how do you hope to bridge that gap? Has there been an assessment done of the skills? skills that Nigeria specifically needs and then matched to the skills that you know those uh, professionals will be building capacity uh, absolutely so NITDA which is an agency under me conducted a talent gap analysis last year which was looking at uh, what are the skill sets required by industry and what are the s talent suppliers Providing So they, they identify the gap for where opportunity lies. But what I like about that analysis is it didn't just focus on Nigeria. Okay. Because the, global, the technology space is Talent global. It's global, it's, it's global yeah. as well. So it also looked at, you know, LinkedIn has published a lot of insight on talent gap globally. You know, there's extremely huge gap in workforce for technology globally. Right. So that's what we've leveraged. So we've started with only 10 um, uh, particular streams and those streams are focused on where we see job opportunities, immediate job opportunities, both locally and also outside of the country. So training 3 million, the goal is not to retain all of them. We know we're not going to be, be able to retain <laughs> But we want Nigeria to become a net exporter of technical mm. talents. Where in Switzerland, if we look at countries like this, technology is everywhere. Yes. Right. So they're going to continue to require technology uh, workforce to help pull up and lift their economies. But the reality is these countries are aging in terms of population and they're not giving birth to, to more people. Mm. So Nigeria, we're in a very firm position to actually help power the workforce that the world requires for technology. On, on artificial intelligence, yeah. um, are we jumping the gun? Um, because, you know, you look at connectivity around it. 5G, according to the NCC, only 0.8% of coverage in Nigeria. 60% uh, of the country is on 2G. I mean, as far as the, I mean, I know you've talked extensively about artificial intelligence. Yeah. It's a theme here. 
Uh, uh, is it, can we walk and chew gum at the same time? Can we talk about that while also addressing our other developmental issues? No, no, we can. And in development is what we call wicked problems, right? In Africa, we're often faced with challenges where, you know, we have poverty, uh, there's not enough. Ten years ago, ten years ago on the continent, to fix education, we were told we needed to be building more schools and training more teachers. Fast forward to today because of digital technologies, it's about how can you use technology to help teachers teach better? How can you use technology to help learners learn at home for remediation? Right, that's what we're talking about today. So the world is constantly moving and it's a wicked problem because the requirement for addressing a lot of our problems are constantly shifting. But oftentimes we're fixated on what we've always known about those challenges. Right. And the reality is you're here in Davos, you've seen half of the conversations here about artificial intelligence. Absolutely. We're talking about the fact that there's no good workforce in the world. They're gonna need workforce, we have young people. If we don't prioritize artificial intelligence, how are we going to be able to play in that space? None of us expected generative AI last year. Right. Exactly. Do you use it? Like we do. We yeah, all use yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so, so, so if we wait and say it's not for us, you know, right. I was talking to someone, this is a very touchy conversation on social investment. Do you know that AI can help us understand how to appropriate our funding for social investment better? Because the, the poor people the, that, that needs our help that we're trying to serve, that we're trying to lift up, uh, their needs are very clear, but if you don't understand what they're spending the resources on, how can you better serve them to help lift them forward? The data set that you collect on transactions is massive. There's nothing you and I can do with it. AI can help us make sense out of it. Yes, indeed. And, you know, Bill Gates was talking about AI helping to increase productivity. And yeah. I note, I think some months back, you put out a call for yeah. AI specialists and I, the response yeah. was quite... It was, it was immense. Yeah, it was yeah. immense. And I'm glad you mentioned social investment because yeah. I was going to ask you... If you could pick one of our development challenges yeah. now in Nigeria, in Nigeria and apply some of the technology solutions yeah. you're looking at, yeah. which one would be right on top of your list of priorities? Because we've thought about social, social investment. And, and the reason why is um, I've spent a few months working with the president. Uh, this is a man that is extremely passionate about seeing significant shift in society. That's the only conversation that we've had. That's why he made the ministers to sign bond. And he's taking it seriously, he's set up an office to track it because he wants to see changes in, in society. The social investment effort, there's a significant amount of money. If we all rally around and support the president's intention, we can truly lift our people up, not just give them handouts. And the more we lift them up, the more we add to that workforce, productive workforce that we want to see, the more we grow our economy. And I think we all will benefit from it. The Nigerian government, from what I've seen, has been spending resources to try and make society better. But unfortunately, as you're pushing, there's so many things you're pushing back at. So we need to be having meaningful conversations. The intellect amongst us needs to participate in finding ways to help truly make things happen for our society. Yeah, we're wrapping up. So only less than a minute to go. How, what's your outlook for 2024 in terms of the milestones you set and what we can achieve? I see, uh, for, for, for my ministry, I think uh, from the body language we're getting, I think the talent accelerator, 3MTT, will, will, will move on really well. We're already seeing nations and companies paying attention to it. We will see some of our people getting gainful employment because they've been through that program. So I expect that will change the moods among, amongst young people. The other is the backbone. Uh, I truly believe that we have a significant opportunity to leapfrog uh, fiber optic ne network in the country because $2, million, uh, $2 billion dollars, uh, a small amount of money for the size of impact that we can generate. Thank you very much, Dr. Bosso Tijani. I think one thing that really struck me about is how Africa can serve as a global talent pool for the rest of the world, amongst other areas. We've been joined by the Honorable Minister for ICT and Digital Economy, myself and Rotus Odiri, reporting live here in Davos 2024 for Arise News. Absolutely. Many thanks for that very refreshing conversation. And of course, that was brought to you by Rota Sodiri and Rolaki Akukube Fulani from the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. Many thanks. Now you're watching the Global Business Report here on Arise News. Coming up, Shell sells onshore Nigerian oil assets for $2.4 billion. To Renaissance Africa Energy Detail shortly, stay with us. The Dan Gote Group stands at the forefront of African enterprise. Since 1978, we've touched the lives of millions of people by meeting their basic needs. 
Our belief in the promise of Africa has taken us into 14 African countries with substantial investments that will propel the continent towards greater prosperity, promising jobs, improved standards of living and economic growth. Dan Gote, for an empowered Africa. If you are truly ready to change the world through sustainable practices, here are 10 epic tips to live with less waste and make a difference. Tip 1. BYOB. Bring your own bottle. Ditch single-use plastic and groove with a reusable water bottle. Tip 2. Skip the straws. Say no to plastic straws and groove with reusable or biodegradable alternatives. Tip 3. Reduce food waste. Tip 4. Repair. Don't replace if it can be avoided. Tip 5. Switch it off. Turning off lights and appliances when not in use can reduce electricity consumption by up to 10% in African households. Tip 6. Water wise. A dripping tap can waste up to 5,000 liters of water. Tip 7. Go paperless. Tip 8. Recycle right. Tip 9. Sustainable transportation. Switching to carpooling for just one day a week can reduce carbon emissions and ease congestion. Tip 10. Conscious consumerism. If every household in Africa replaced one regular light bulb with an energy efficient one, you could save enough energy to power millions of homes for a year. Come join us. Together, we, we can, can make, make a difference. difference. Let us take you on a journey towards the fearless pursuit of knowledge. Navigating uncharted territories and taking bold, fearless steps towards a future shaped by courage and discovery as young, ambitious minds begin their quest for learning at a university. Pulling together people of diverse backgrounds to build a fearless generation that will change the future of our country and our continent. Wigwe University awaits a testament to the power of education and unwavering spirit of those who dare to be fearless. Wigwe University, where the fearless make history. Now open for admission into the 2024-2025 session. Guy, with the rising cost of things, we need to plan our next move. Guy, I agree with you. I mean, with the money we make, we should not be struggling with our finances now. Maybe you both need better banking options. What do you know about better banking options? <laughs> I recently moved my salary account to Polaris Bank, and since then, it's been a smooth ride for me. They bought over my existing loan and gave me better interest rates and repayment terms. Are you serious? Yes, as a Polaris salary account holder, I can get personal term loan, auto loan, mortgage, 50% salary advance, credit card, and more without going to the bank. Really? I've got a personal term loan already. See, here's my credit card too. How do I make the move? Simple. Open a Polaris salary account on Vault. Use salary account as your referral code. My guy, I am moving my salary accounts now, now. Get personal term loan and more with your Polaris salary account. Vault is available on Google Play Store and Apple App Store. Salary and Welcome back to the Global Business Report here on Arise News. Now, according to the most recent report from the National Bureau of Statistics, the Federal Account Allocation Committee distributed 1.3 
1.35 trillion naira to the three levels of government in November 2023, drawing on funds collected in October 2023. Now, the NBS provided the following breakdown of the November 2023 allotments to the three levels of government. A total of 323.35 billion naira was given to the federal government, 307.72 billion naira to the states, and 225.21 billion naira to local governments. For a sum of $2.8 billion, oil giant Shell has agreed to sell its onshore Nigerian assets to Renaissance, a group of four Nigerian companies on an international one. In a statement released on Tuesday, Shell's London office stated that as a result of the agreement, Andy Weston, Aridol Energy, First ENP, Walter Smith and Petrolin will now manage its onshore subsidiary, the Shell Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria. Shell, however, clarified that the federal government's permission is still in need for the deal's conclusion. Shell, which has been conducting business in Nigeria for more than 60 years, says that it will keep conducting offshore and deep water activities in the country. Now, Arise business analyst Chikam Bonu joins me for more on the stories. Mr. Chika, it's such a pleasure to have you. Happy New Year to you because I haven't seen you very well. Thank you. Happy New Year. Great. All right, so quite a bit to get through. Of course, we're going to begin with Renaissance Africa Energy. Our life, the blood of Nigeria, which is oil and gas. Absolutely. So let's look at that. Let's try and unpack some of the things that are there. I mean, we have always known that several years ago, I think maybe 10 years ago, thereabout, Shell announced that they were exiting the onshore operation um, um, in Nigeria for a plethora of reasons, uh, the, the, including the fact that the bigger picture is that fossil fuel has ceased to be an attraction worldwide for investment. Indeed, a lot of shareholders of these international oil companies have been pushing them to exit you know, fossil fuel. Fossil fuel basically like um, the petroleum exploration that we do in Nigeria for our viewers and then to go to more renewable energy um, um, sources. And that has been the, that, that. But the, the undercurrent there has been also the fact that uh, even if um, Shell were to be in that business, the challenges that um, have been um, um, confronting them in the onshore operation in Nigeria and the shallow waters in Nigeria have been momentous, including the fact of um, the one we know Nigeria is battling with now, which is a lot of stolen crude, vandalism of pipes, um, and the community issues and challenges. And so um, a lot of the international companies have been selling the, their onshore assets. Basically, oil is done in onshore. Onshore means land or near land. And then offshore is like in the deep water in the ocean. And that's the way oil is prospected in Nigeria. So most of the onshore things, the ones done on land, the international companies have been selling them off. Arise, arising from the little secret challenges they've been facing, uh, vandalism, you know, um, stolen crude, and some other, you know, um, um, investment challenges they've been facing in Nigeria. So um, this is not um, um, surprising that that has happened, uh, because even um, um, the other oil companies have um, had assets that have they've sold. Indeed, um, uh, to date, we've had about $21 billion of assets that these IOCs have actually sold. And the other thing that you have, that um, uh, statistics can, that was worth mentioning there is that in 2014, for example, the investment in, investment in oil and gas by these oil companies have been about, about something like $27 billion. In last year, it was about just merely $6 billion. So you can see that they have been slowly be pulling out from that sector. So that is the, 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 the major thing. So for Shell, they put it out there. One, uh, they've been trying to get off, sell off the assets in, um, in off onshore in Nigeria. Two, the, which I found very funny was that is to simplify their portfolio, uh, you know, operation. I mean, that, that's not that here or there. But be that as it may, they are takers for these assets, which in this case happens to be a consortium of five companies. These five companies, four of them are exploration and, and, um, and producing companies already existing in Nigeria. And then one international oil, um, oil, oil energy company. So those have come together under this group of Renaissance to, you know, um, purchase this asset. Again, as you mentioned during your rundown, subject to government um, 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 approvals, simply because of the fact that in this joint venture, you know how this works is this joint venture has about I think uh, 15 oil wells 
you have 15 oil wells, you have 15 oil, oil mining leases onshore, and three uh, oil mining leases shallow water. Shell is the operator. Shell manages, manages it for the joint venture. But the joint venture is as follows. Shell owns only 30% of the total thing. NMPC owns 55% of the whole total thing. Uh, total owns 30%. And then Ajip owns five percent, but it's been operated by Shell. So Shell um, management team, Shell technology, Shell operations, and everything is running that on behalf of the joint venture. So this agreement says that that will continue after this, you know, sell, you know, because of fact that if you take away, they take away that, it might it might affect the quality of the productions, you know. But the, the bigger issue there, why we celebrate the fact that the Nigerian um, uh, EMP companies are able to acquire this asset. The, the, the longer term, term issue for us is, do they have the capabilities? You know, um, that Shell has. Do they have the reach that Shell has? Do they have the financing, finance raising power that Shell has? And that's the major problem. So some people say this is not a loss. I think it's a major loss for us. I mean, I, I don't want to sugarcoat it. Shell exiting this um, uh, onshore is, is a loss for us. And I've got Shell, Shell has a lot of pedigree. But of course, these Nigerian companies are growing. And the way you can measure it is also what has happened to the past acquisitions that Nigerian companies have, um, have, have bought. How are, they, how are they faring and how are they doing? Will the challenges that made Shell exit this onshore operation not affect this Nigerian um, 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 uh, team also if they take over? Yeah, the NUPLC, the Regulatory Commission for up, up, Upstream, has said, oh, these Nigerian, Nigerian um, buyers know the terrain more. But the issue is that the same challenges of oil theft, vandalism, community challenges will also affect them. And so the bigger picture for, this, for the government is to make sure that the, the, the environment for you know, oil you know, prospecting in Nigeria, as documented in the Petroleum Industry Act, is 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 um, is is, is um, achieved and make the environment the the horizon good for um, all these people to invest in. Right. And for me, that's that, that's the first line in in in, that, in, that, in this acquisition. I'm very glad that you mentioned that because it's very important for us to know the basis and the history of Shell's operations in Nigeria, which, as you mentioned, has been quite a tumultuous one. Mm -hmm. Over time, we have the environmental damage, oil spills in the Ogoni land. You know, you had this big revolt mm -hmm. around it. And then you also had more recently the acquisition of the <coughs> OPL 245 mm -hmm. license in, in, mm -hmm. in partnership with ENI. Mm -hmm. That also made it a bit of a checkered history. Mm -hmm. And the more important question is how will this new, you know, acquisition affect Renaissance Energy? Are mm -hmm. they are they ready? Do they have the bandwidth to, to face these challenges, or are they going to be? Is it going to be a bit more navigable in a in a different manner? I mean, that, that's why it was important. I guess they put it out there that even though Shell is exiting ownership, that the technical support will still be provided by Shell, as they were providing it for the gem venture. Remember, I mentioned the gem venture is Shell, NMPC, um, Total, and um, Ajip. Yeah. But Shell was running for the group. That Shell, I guess now for remuneration, be providing it to this uh, Renaissance group so that there will be no um, dilution in the quality of management and prospecting that's, uh, ha that's going to happen to this um, oil mining leases that, that they have. You know, so I guess that's 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 why they put it out there. Right. And that is very it's very important that that's that stays. Yes, yes. We'll now, but uh, having that having out. said that, the, the uh, Nigerian. Upstream Energy Regulatory Commission said they had developed six, six level templates, six item templates on which they used to measure these um, uh, divestments. Okay. You know, and that each buyer, including the Renaissance, or I wonder as the case may be for the last, uh, last uh, um, um, sale, must qualify along those. It includes technical ability, includes financial ability, okay, so some includes some ESG measurability measure, 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 yeah, to make well. sure. That even though that they are taking it over, it's not just a walk, a walk in the park. Absolutely not. They make sure they are competent enough to do that. You well, know, I financing don't... is going to be a major issue to raise about 2.3 or 2.4 billion dollars for this kind of transaction in this market now, especially when fossil fuel has ceased to be a major attraction for investment in international bankers. It's also going to be a major challenge. Very but that presents opportunities again for Nigerian local banks yeah. to see how they can take on That's this. That's a colossal amount, yeah. so we have to wait and see how mm -hmm. things play mm -hmm. out. But let's mm -hmm. move on very quickly now to 
fact, this person a sum of 1.35 trillion naira to you know federal government, states, local governments. What do we make of this? Okay, okay, just for our viewers also, the way FAC works is the revenue that's collected in one month in a preceding month is shared in the succeeding month. Okay, the too much grammar. The revenue, for example, in October, collected in October, is what is shared in the, like the first week of uh, November. Okay. So that's what was pushed out there now. Okay, what was shared in November, what was, what, what was end in um, October for the country. Now, and, and <clears throat> from the one shared in October, it was about 1.6 trillion. The one in November is about 1. So there's the, 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 the a slight fall in the revenues. But be that as it may, these are still colossal amounts that were shared between the federal government of Nigeria and the states. And each time I come here, I say the, the radar, the focus usually on the federal, federal government, what I've done and I've not done. But the challenges we have in our country are because there's some national governments, and I put it out there always consistently, the states, so much money is entering into their hands, but we're seeing very, very, very little. You know, um, and that touch because they are, they are very close to the citizens of the country who should, you know, feel the democracy dividend. And, and I mentioned that because if you come to Lagos here and talk about the blue line, I keep talking about selecting the blue line because in the land of the blind, one eyed man is the king. So the people who live in order to relay my two axes now who come to Marina to, to work, you know, that's, I mean, they feel it. That's the kind of thing we're talking about that state governments shall, shall do. We copy this democracy from, say, America. Usually, for those who want to play at the national level, for the governors, they, they turn back and say, look at what I've done in my state. I'm ready for the national level now. And you could see that during the last election cycle, there were some one or two people who got former governors who put on, on, on under pressure here and say, you want to contest for this, this presidential senate, you want to contest for this, you know, show us your testimonials. And somebody asked us, hey, does it matter? But it really matters. So I say it again, if you look at through the horizon now, that six states plus FCT, what is happening? You know, what's happening? A lot of money are entering into the hands of these governors. Apart from maybe one or two state governors that you see things happening, the issue is what are they doing with all the money? Certainly the first thing that charges is the governor's security votes. Yet, billions are put into that, down to that line. Yet, look at the level of insecurity we have in our, in our country. The kidnap kidnapping has gone to the highest levels. And the human life has, means nothing for us now. If you look at states, so a lot of states are owing pensioner salaries, owing teacher salaries, owing civil servant salaries, backlog. Yet, every month, you have this momentous big amounts of money entering into the hands of states. And so, things are not happening in our country, not just because of the federal level, but because of also the subnational governments, states and local governments, and not showing us what they're doing with all this money they're entering into their hands. So there's a lack of transparency as a key transparency. issue here. And, and the sad thing again is that the guardrails, which happens supposed to be the houses of assembly, have entered into the pockets of most of the governors. And so you don't see any development. What, what we just see is consumption, consumption. Today you hear the uh, governor buys 400 jeeps for houses of speaker and house of assembly. 400 Jews for, you know, just uh, uh, the traditional rulers. So those who should talk are not talking because they've been settled. And so everything is just out there. Nobody's talking. And teachers are owed salaries. Civil servants are owed salaries. Rules are not being done. The simple thing, health centers are not being kept. Child immortality is, uh, mortality is very high. Women dying pregnant. I mean, so many and simple things going on. And so nothing is really happening in a lot of states. And that's the cycle continues. Four years will come and go, and that four years will go. I mean, it surprises me sometimes when governor, a governor after doing four years is going around struggling to campaign for election. When he's, they look at the roads I've done, look at the health centers I've done, I pay teacher salary on time, I'm not owing pensioners, go give me for second time. That's supposed to be the campaign. But that's not what's happening. Rather, they spend the money on doing other things so that shenanigans, so that election will be fair for them. You know, so, uh, yeah. You, our viewers are hearing you know, billions, billions, billions shared, 1.2 trillion shared. But how has it affected the life of the citizens? Absolutely. Very important. When question. the first something was moved, we were told about uh, 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 what they call palliatives. The governors have about 4 billion in palliatives for, per state. Who? I don't know whether anybody has felt that palliative. You know, so, what are we doing? What are we really doing? So, uh, fact allocation, I like the news, is out there and so on and so forth. But the issue is, 
how is it affecting the life of our citizens? All right, and clearly there's some very big loopholes And there. citizens are really suffering. I mean, I don't know of you, but I know that citizens are suffering. People are, people are dying, people are complaining. And, and the, go, the people in authority must do something about it. Absolutely. Mm. It's a sad reality and a hard pill to swallow. But of course, on another day, we have to talk about what's the way forward and how do we get there. I want to thank you so much, Rice Business you. Analyst, Chikan Bunny. Great to see you again. And of course, we'll see you again thank very you. soon. You're watching the Global Business Report here on Rise News. Plenty more ahead. Stay with us. Thinking of banking in Africa, think Zenith. In today's fast-moving, fast-changing world, you need a financial partner that understands your unique expectations. A bank with presence in major financial centers across the world, with the enabling platform to facilitate seamlessly, whenever, wherever, however. A bank with best-in-class financial solutions from a superb combination of technology and human touch for easy, fast, and secure banking that creates real value. Turning dreams into reality is now in your hands. People, technology, service. Zenith Bank, in your best interest. As a player, there's nothing better than the roar of your crowd. But in Nigeria, there's a roar that may not be heard again. With fewer than 50 lions left, they could be extinct in the next few years. From loss of habitat and prey, and snares set for illegal bushmeat. So please, say no to illegal bushmeat. Let's keep the roar alive for Nigeria. Because poaching steals from us all. Welcome back to the Global Business Report here on Arise News. Now, the Office of a Senior Special Assistant to the President on Technical Vocational and Entrepreneurship Education has organized a complimentary level work training for some youth in Lagos State with the aim of empowerment and economic contribution. During the event, insights into the program's objectives were shared with emphasis on the event's core goals. Other speakers stressed the significant potential of the leather industry, highlighting its capacity to contribute significantly to the nation's economy if properly harnessed. Let's take a look. One of our mandates is to increase the number of skilled workers in the youth in Nigeria. Currently it's at 15%. We want to move that up to 50%. From the low skilled and the semi skilled, we're trying to push it up to create more economic activity in the country and increase the highly skilled to 15%. So that's one of the reasons why we put this program together. This program is about bringing people in the local community and even in Lagos at large to come and learn a skill, which is in leather works and how to make shoes, shoemakers, to learn a skill, to use that skill to unlock a door for prosperity for them. The training is just is a three weeks to a month training they're about. So what's happening in the training is for them to understand the basics of the footwear making, both the industrial side, how to use the machineries, um, and how to also produce shoes for themselves, like slippers and basic shoes. But power is one of our biggest challenges because we are heavy on power. And we work two shifts, like I said. And you know, working two shifts, being heavy on power, that's, that's a lot. So it takes a lot of our resources. We spend most of our you know, margins on power. So those are like the basic challenges um, that we currently face. The leather industry is a very big one that even the federal government is very interested in. So uh, the uh, gain for the people that are learning is so enormous if they put their interest more in making sure that, yes, they have the required standard skill. And that is why we are here, to support this program uh, by supervising the instructors to make sure that the standard is followed. Well, that's it on the Global Business Report for now, but stay tuned to Rise News. From all of us, many thanks for your company. I'm Abby Olawe.
let us take you on a journey towards the fearless pursuit of knowledge. Navigating uncharted territories and taking bold, fearless steps towards a future shaped by courage and discovery as young, ambitious minds begin their quest for learning at a university. Pulling together people of diverse backgrounds to build a fearless generation that will change the future of our country and our continent. Wigwe University awaits a testament to the power of education and the unwavering spirit of those who dare to be fearless. Wigwe University, where the fearless make history. Now open for admission into the 2024-2025 session. Where's Glory? Excuse me, ma'am. Hello! Oh, where's Glow now? I don't hear you. Glow, Glow, don't go village. Tie all our customer a bit. Everybody pay attention. See, eh? Now Glow barricated 10x. Now he might they take tension, my customers. Now he they dash me 10 times the credits when I load. Why even some me double data join? Eh? Yeah. yeah. Wait, so, so with one fire, we they give on the boss, so you they enjoy up to 15,000 naira credit and data. And I say I never finish you. See, when I say we enjoy, if we not join Glow barricated 10x, we not go get 1,000 naira welcome credit. Really? Glow, you don't win. Oh, now see, they here. <laughs> Hello, please. I'm looking for Glow. Please save now. Glow with the fine. Now, Glow with the go. Okay, so Enjoy 10 times the value of your recharge on Glow Barricated 10X. You also get 1,000 naira for calls and data and double data bonus on your subscription. And I'm 19. I've been modeling for a year and a half now. Naomi has managed to juggle both her education and her modeling career perfectly well. Now in her final year in university, the budding model cannot wait to take the industry by storm. The show to start already and like next model like walk and I just want to have that feeling musical. So in Europe, we go for individual cousins for those designers. And some people can get up to 15 shows and you might get just one or nothing at all. So I think it's, it's healthy competition. Agatha honed her craft and soon was cast to walk the Arise Fashion Week twice in a row. This is the second time I did the first show 2019. I'm working for Arise 2020 and I'm so excited. To get to the top, like being among the top models in Nigeria, they're kind of the most difficult thing in the industry. So it's actually very difficult. So it has to do with you being persistent and you being courageous as a model. It's been fun. It's been hectic, stressful, but I think every fashion week you look forward to a lot of things and it's been fun so far. Since 2018, 2019 to date, I've always await Arise Fashion Week. What is Arise going to do for my career as a fashion model? It's going to do a lot. It's going to place me on an international level. Because Arise is one of the biggest fashion shows in Africa. Happy New Year from us to you. Arise Play. You're watching Arise, the world's standout news channel. Proudly independent for more than a decade. Always bold, always fresh. Winner of several awards, local and global. Winner of TV Channel of the Year from peers at the Broadcasting Organizations of Nigeria Awards. 
winner of an Emmy from America's National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. Still, we're changing the conversation to make sense of your world. We'll do it together, because now more than ever, you need a clear voice to guide you home. Arise News, Awards and Beyond. of showbiz. If it's happening in the world of entertainment, you'll be hearing about it here. From what's trending on the socials, to music and movies, and all the latest showbiz gossip from around the world. Join us for a front row seat at the Oscars in Los Angeles, or the biggest moments from Fashion Week. It's fun, it's fresh, and it's packed full of all the entertainment news you need to know. You heard it here first. I'm Kachi Ofia, and this is Arise 360, where every culture matters. Hello and welcome. I am Olutai of Moscow, reporting live from the ancient city of Ibadan, where many have been feared dead and houses destroyed. I'll be bringing you details shortly, but first, other headlines as presented from our Lagos studios. Thank you so much, Olutayo. I'm Cynthia Are. And I'm Sheiton Atigari. Our other top stories this hour. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak prepares for a parliamentary showdown over his plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda. Many members of his party threatened to rebel after they lost a bid to toughen his proposed law. Israeli forces continue to pummel military targets in Gaza despite reaching an agreement with Hamas to deliver desperately needed aid to civilians in the war-torn Palestinian territory. And the Niger Republic and Russia enter military cooperation agreement. Developments comes after Moscow's renewed diplomatic offensive and French pullout from the West African nation. Details in just a moment. Our top story, two people have reportedly lost their lives while properties have been destroyed in Ibadan following an explosion which occurred in the state, sending shock waves across the city metropolis. Reacting to the incident last night, the Oyo State Governor, Sheyi Makinde, called for calm. Makinde, who spoke to journalists, said the explosion, which also injured 77 people, was caused by illegal miners who stored explosive devices in one of the buildings in Bodija area of Ibadan. The State Commissioner for Information and Orientation, Prince Dotsun Oyelade, who confirmed the incident, said residents of Ibadan and the immediate environs experienced an uncommon explosion at 8 p.m. He also said there were various interpretations of the incident, but it was important for, he said, and I quote, for us to state categorically that the state government has taken over and is in full control of the unfortunate occurrence in order to mitigate the incident, end of quote. We have uh, uh, illegal miners uh, turning with explosives around this place. Uh, we've always said to people that uh, uh, when you say something, you say something, and then the authorities should be able to do something. Um, uh, this is quite unfortunate. Uh, at this stage, it's uh, just to uh, 
rescue anyone that is still uh, under the, uh, uh, the rubble here. And also the people that, uh, that have been taken to the hospital uh, to give them uh, care. Um, and uh, uh, also some of the people uh, who have their houses uh, destroyed, provide temporary accommodation for them. Uh, um, at hotels within uh, the city. Uh, and then in the morning, uh, we uh, definitely will uh, continue uh, the investigation. Uh, well, the affected families, uh, uh, I'll say uh, the government is here. We will uh, uh, support them uh, in the recovery uh, uh, effort. But most importantly, uh, uh, at this stage, whatever information we can get, we, we need it. And then uh, uh, we'll, we'll probably act appropriately uh, to this uh, incident. It's just, uh, 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 it's devastating, it's something that uh, 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 it's difficult. So to wrap one's head you know, around this. A rice correspondent, Olutayo Famous Ko, is live at the scene and will bring in us more details about that story later on in the show. Right, then moving now on to the United Kingdom, where the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak is about to face a very raucous parliament this Wednesday over his plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda. Many of his own lawmakers in the Conservative Party are threatening to rebel after they lost an initial bid to toughen his proposed law. The government comfortably defeated attempts to strengthen the bill late on Tuesday that had been backed by almost a fifth of lawmakers from the Prime Minister's party in what was the biggest rebellion yet against him. But he only won because most opposition parties voted against those rebels whose actions to try to toughen the legislation and close what they say are loopholes has again exposed the deep divisions in the governing party. The conservative rebels will now have to decide whether to back down or join forces with opposition parties to try to defeat the government at the law's final stage in the House of Commons, known as a third reading. Israel on Tuesday continued its unrelenting pounding of Gaza despite reaching a deal with Hamas to deliver medicine to hostages and desperately needed aid to civilians in the war-torn Palestinian territory. The deal had been made possible after Qatar and France mediated. The war raging since October 7 has devastated Gaza, which is suffering a severe humanitarian crisis amid inflamed tensions across the Middle East. The health ministry in Gaza says at least 24,448 people have been killed so far since the war began on October the 7th last year. The ministry also stated that over 61,000 people have also been wounded in the Palestinian territory during the war. Meanwhile, the army says it has killed a top Palestinian militant in an airstrike in the occupied West Bank early today, averting a terrorist attack that he was planning. Meanwhile, the military entrance processing stations at the Strasbourg plenary session have been debating the humanitarian situation in Gaza. This comes 102 days after the war was triggered by an attack on southern Israel by the Islamist movement Hamas, which resulted in the death of about 1,140 people on the Israeli side. But if you have come to your senses, dear colleagues, call for justice too. By supporting South Africa's initiative to take Israel to the International Court of Justice to establish the genocidal nature of its actions, but also by suspending our partnership agreement with Israel and halting our arms exports to Israel. In short, dear colleagues, 
by ending our complicity with the European Union. Israel has the right to self-defense and to bring its hostages home. At the same time, civilians in Gaza have the right to protection and humanitarian aid. And the crucial question is, how can both be achieved? This is the debate we need to have with Israelis, with Palestinians, with our Arab partners. Alors, oui, il faut aider le peuple palestinien. So yes, we need to help the Palestinian people get out of the hell they're in. Yes, massive humanitarian aid is needed, and for it to be distributed, the weapons must be silenced. Is Hamas calling for a ceasefire? No, they want to continue the war. The Palestinian people deserve to live in peace, to have a state and an end to colonization. Supporting the Palestinian people also means helping them get out of the straitjacket in which Hamas has tried to trap them. It's something unimaginable that could have happened. The atrocities, the kidnapping of poor young people, and that still their families don't know their whereabouts. It's a reminder of how cruel we are. Not many of you mentioned the hostages. Not only Hamas that is keeping the hostages in Gaza, but they're keeping hostage the whole people, trying to get a sympathy to divide Europe and to divide the world. Addressing supporters at a rally in New Hampshire, Donald Trump says he plans to attend daily court proceedings in the phony defamation case against him in New York after, over the next several days while continuing the campaign. We're going to go to one of these phony cases tonight where we have tomorrow morning early, nice and early. You know what I do? My, here's my schedule for the next four or five days. I come here. I meet with great groups in New Hampshire. I then get on a plane late at night when it's snowing and freezing out. Wonderful. And the pilots say, sir, it's going to be tough. And I get there early in the morning. I go to a Biden witch hunt. And then I come here in the afternoon and I stop and we make speeches and we get your votes and all that stuff. Nobody's ever had to do this before. These people are disgraceful. They're a disgrace to our country. I want to just leave this. We are going to win on Tuesday at a level that maybe could even be bigger than what we just did last night in Iowa. Thousands of people have rallied in the Serbian capital of Belgrade to protest alleged fraud committed by President Aleksandr Vukic's governing party during the parliamentary and local elections last month. The rally was the latest in a string of protests following elections in December, in which Vucic's party excuse me, said it secured a commanding victory. The match comes just days after a Serbian opposition party formally lodged a complaint against alleged fraud by the party. I came here because of the electoral fraud. I want change. I want this country's institutions to work. We live under a regime where there are no values, no laws, no morality to be seen. I wouldn't be surprised if one day someone knocks on my door and tells me it's no longer my apartment. Now we move on. We will never give up on our plans until elections in Belgrade are held again. Never, never we will leave Serbia, and we will fight until the end, and we will win. We will remove this coward, points finger towards the presidency building, sooner or later, but under our conditions and our rules. Long life free Serbia, and thank you, dear people. You're watching news, we have plenty more still ahead. Stay with us. As a player, there's nothing better than the roar of your crowd. But in Nigeria, there's a roar that may not be heard again. With fewer than 50 lions left, they could be extinct in the next few years. From loss of habitat and prey, and snares set for illegal bushmeat. So please, say no to illegal bushmeat. Let's keep the roar alive for Nigeria. Because poaching steals from us all.
Hello, my name is Odumba Tayo. I was once a stylist, but I wasn't having much passion in it because I was forced to do that. And the only person I understand my feeling was my church pastor who introduced me into this training that's um, Afro Fidelity and helped me to apply for it. And it was just like a dream come true for me. My name is Engina Joyobi, popularly known as Lady Benz Auto Mechanic, Nigeria first female Mercedes Benz specialist. I met F Fidelity a, a year ago to partner with me and partnering with Fidelity has been a very huge relief for me. There's a lot of people out there who actually want to acquire these skills, but they don't have the opportunity. Platforms such as this provide the opportunity to drive the necessary conversations around promoting a world free of gender bias. We are Fidelity. We keep our word. Welcome back to Newsday. Thank you for staying with us. In a significant development, Russia and Niger, currently under military rule following a coup last year, have announced plans to enhance military cooperation. Russian deputy defense ministers met with the UNTA's appointed defense minister, Salif Modi, determined to bolster defense relations. The Russian Defense Ministry aims to intensify collaborative efforts to stabilize the regional situation, focusing on enhancing Niger's military combat readiness. The junta, led by General Abdurrahmani Tiani, seized power in July 2023, raising concerns as it expelled French troops and severed security and severed security agreements with the European Union. Now, the UNTA's appointed Prime Minister, Mohamed Lamine Zain, has also arrived in Moscow to discuss broader partnerships in defence, agriculture and energy. Now, in the northern region of Niger, the historic town of Agadez is witnessing a revival as a crucial transit hub for migration. The repeal of a 2015 law criminalising migrant trafficking through Niger following the military coup in July, has reinvigorated the town's role as a gateway to the Sahara. The law's repeal aims to facilitate migration to North Africa and Europe, as well as boost the local economy. While some drivers remain skeptical and use clandestine routes, others appreciate the repeal and hope it will lead to regulation, ensuring safer conditions for migrants. Yes, since the repeal of the act, people were really were, were happy, people applauded this repeal of the act. Because if you want now, you can take a, a you can take passengers quiet, you can go wherever you want. But in the past, it was not easy, it is as if you were seen with drugs, you are prosecuted by the authorities, you are incarcerated in prisons, because following that many people were arrested, there are many people who lost their job. The law against immigration has increased a lot of criminality here in Agadez, because before people were doing activities, and now people have no work, so drug trafficking has been increased, banditry has been increased, even because of a simple motorcycle, people will kill you to take the bike. This is all the law that brought it here. We do not traffic, it is the Europeans with Mohamed Yusufu, the former president, who say that it is traffic, it is not traffic. We, we do a job normally, we work with military convoys, before, when there was no law, migrants, it is every Monday that they live in the convoys until arriving at the border, from Libya, so there were no problems, now when the law was passed, so work has become a big problem, people are not working. We can say that it has facilitated many things for us what? Because before Agades, when you go out, you are afraid how the authorities will not arrest you or the population even will not ask you if you are a migrant. But at the time, everything is simple, everything is simple. Everything is easy in the hands of migrants. Migrants travel normal, they cross to Libya, to Algeria too. Meanwhile, the conflict in Sudan, spanning nine months between rival generals, has intruded on the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, posing a threat to the remains of the ancient Kingdom of Kush. 
The regional network for cultural rights condemned the attack by the Rapid Support Forces, also known as the RSF, on the religious sites of Nakwa and the Musawarat S. Sufra, highlighting potential vandalism, destruction, looting and theft. The conflict between the RSF forces and those loyal to the Sudanese army chief Abdel Fattah al-Burhan has caused distress endangering the archaeological sites of the island of Moreau, known for its pyramids, temples and ancient dwellings. Over 13,000 lives have been lost since the war began and more than 7 million have since been displaced. Meanwhile, Sudan's army-aligned government has suspended ties with the East African bloc IGAD, accusing it of violating the country's sovereignty by inviting paramilitary chief Mohamed Hamdan Daglo to a summit. The move follows the army's territorial losses and Daglo's diplomatic tour. The invitation prompted the foreign ministry to announce the suspension of its relationship with IGAD, accusing it of setting a dangerous precedent. While IGAD, the U.S. and Saudi Arabia attempted mediation between the warring generals, tensions persist. Over now to the Comoros, where Azali Asumani, the former coup leader and current chairman of the African Union, has won his re-election, dismissing claims of fraud and a low voter turnout. The Electoral Mission has announced that Asumani secured 62.97% of the vote, paving the way for a third consecutive term until 2029. However, only 16.3% of the electorate participated in the election. Opposition candidates who had already expressed concerns about ballot stuffing and fraud released the joint statements denouncing the alleged irregularities. If the Supreme Court validates the results, Asumani will continue his presidency in the island nation, which has experienced multiple coups since gaining independence in 1975. The candidates obtained respectively Azali Asumani, 33,209 or 62.97%. 62.97%. It was the people of the Comoros who made the choice, so yes, in our predictions we were expecting it, but we were pleasantly surprised by the outcome. Now the hardest part remains showing the people who put their trust in us that they were right to do so. We are going to carry on, we've already made a start on everything, whether it's education, health, roads, energy or entrepreneurship, it's all underway, now it's time to consolidate. There's nothing new to begin. Everything has to be built on. Well, the African Union Observer Mission, led by former Burundian President Domitien Ndazizeye, has declared that the presidential election in the Comoros went well overall. This statement comes despite reported incidents in the opposition stronghold of Anjouan and Moheli Islands, where violence occurred following the election. We said that the elections went well overall and that, I repeat, if you did not hear correctly, it was peaceful, tranquil. We have not recorded any disasters. Until now there are no demonstrations, there are grumblings, and we ask them if you have problems, go straight to the institutions that are provided for by law. The situation as it stands makes the Comorians move forward in the peace process, in the democratic process. If there have been shortcomings, we have made recommendations so that they can sit down and correct them. Over to Mogadishu in Somalia, where a deadly suicide bombing near the, mayoral, the mayor's office had claimed at least three lives and left two others injured. The attacker targeted a crowded area, detonating an explosive device near a restaurant. Details are still emerging, but eyewitness reports uh, a chaotic scene with a vehicle catching fire after the blast. While no group has claimed responsibility, Mogadishu has been a frequent target of attacks by the Al-Shabaab Al militants group. This extremist organization linked to Al-Qaeda has been active for over a decade, aiming to overthrow the internationally backed Somali government. The capital, Mogadishu, was under Al-Shabaab control 
until 2011 when African Union troops forced them out. However, the group continues to hold significant territory in rural Somalia. Well, Angolan billionaire Isabel dos Santos' lawyer has said the fresh criminal charges against her are politically motivated. Angola's public prosecutor has charged Ms. dos Santos with 12 crimes, including embezzlement and fraud. The charges relate to Ms. dos Santos' time as chair of a state-owned oil firm. Critics of Ms. dos Santos have long claimed she used her position of influence in Angola to enrich herself at the expense of the state, allegations she strongly refuted. In response to last week's indictment, her lawyer said Isabel de Santos rejects the trumped-up charges by the Angolan government, which have been launched as part of a sustained campaign of political persecution against her by President João Lourenço. Meanwhile, China's foreign minister, Wang Yi, has said China will continue to firmly support Togo in safeguarding its sovereignty, security and development interests. Mr. Wang, who is also a member of the political bureau of the Communist Party of China Central Committee, made the remarks while arriving at the Lome Toiken International Airport. Wang paid a visit to Togo on invitation after concluding his visit to Tunisia. Dosi, who made a special trip to greet Wang at the airport, said that Togo firmly upholds the One China principle and supports the Chinese government's position on the Taiwan question. Well, the Democratic Republic of Congo is relying on troops from the Southern African Development Community, also known as the SADC, to regain territory seized by the M23 militia in the country's troubled eastern region. The M23, dormant for years, resumed activities in late 2021, taking control of large parts of North Kivu province. The SADC force, which includes soldiers from South Africa, Tanzania and Malawi, have been arriving in the DRC since December. The deployment is part of a regional response to counter the resurgent rebellion. President Bola Tinubu on Tuesday met with service chiefs and other top brass of security agencies in Abuja, ostensibly to discuss the worsening spate of insecurity across the country. The service chiefs in attendance included the Chief of Defence Staff, General Christopher Musa, the Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Tawarid Lagwaja, the Chief of Air Staff, Air Marshal Hazan Abubakar, and the Chief of Naval Staff, Vice Admiral Emmanuel Ogala. Meanwhile, the Inspector General of Police, Kayode Egbetokun, earlier on Monday, convened a crucial meeting with the force management team and tactical squads to address the rising concerns surrounding insecurity in the country. Security and policy analyst Dr. Kaber Adamu joins us now to discuss this latest round of presidential summons and how government at all levels can redouble efforts shoring up security as well as curb crimes. Many thanks for being here, uh, Dr. Kabir. Always here, of course, uh, we're talking about insecurity. And now we're looking at this uh, recent meeting with the service chiefs. What specific measures and strategies would you say should be top priority to address this prevalent issue of, of abductions and, of course, overall crime in the country, especially in the context of ab abduction pandemics? Over the last week, 